because we are live now we welcome you all back to chapter 8 of the youthful web series under the aegis of iirsi today's topic is one of the most challenging topics on zeroing on in on the correct laser beam our aim at the end of the session is that we know how to select a correct patient and select an accurate choice of refractive platform for your practice we have with us refractive pioneers who will shed light on this topic We welcome our IRSI president, Dr. Himanshu Mehta, to inaugurate the session. Good evening, friends. Thank you, Pooja, and thank you, panel, Dr. Vinodara. Thank you for being there, Rohan, Nikhil, Anshika, Ashok, Dr. Vardhan, everybody. Good evening, and thank you all for being there, friends. As you know, that refractive surgery is an essential part of modern medicine today. Cataract surgery itself has become refractive surgery. it's no longer the good old cataract surgery which is there it is refractive surgery so every anterior segment surgeon unquestionably should be doing refractive surgery there is no no doubt in my mind about that if you can do a collision then you can do definitely do a lasik surgery have that confidence you'll be able to go ahead you just need to have a little push in life you need to read up do your homework well you have fantastic machines to support your your full infrastructure the topography machines have changed and the new schlem flag has really helped us understand the anterior cornea and the posterior cornea all that you see right now when you're going to be hearing in the next hour or so should encourage you to start a refractive practice as early as possible because if you are not because there are a lot of people i saw a lot of students of mine who said i don't get refractive patients i don't get patients who want lasik this is absolutely wrong you start doing it and you will suddenly see patients increasing you could suggest in the beginning but unless you start the ball starts rolling you will not be able to invite patients because if you don't do it the word will spread that you are not doing it so there is no reason for anybody not to do refractive surgery it is an essential part of your private practice you're missing out a lot of stuff it's like giving intravitreal injection you cannot miss a general ophthalmologist cannot miss giving intravitreal injection same way refractive practice well whether lasik whether prk whether the femto lasik or a micro keratome or is a smile better and of course all those patients who are not good for any of these refractive procedures you have icl implantable columnar lenses the icl the ipcl lots of work has been done across the world on this and you have huge pioneers in this country you have fantastic results and all those patients who are above minus 10 15 20 25 who you thought were inoperable you can see the happiness on their face it's a phenomenal change in their quality of life their confidence and their approach to the society and this is not a small percentage of population mind you refractive surgery can be a huge number of patients for you and as more and more surgeons start doing it and more patients start accepting it what resistance dr arora we faced 10 15 years back and what it is today is there is an amazing difference patients have started accepting earlier there used to be ke kisne kiya hai malum nahi hai kya hota hai how many eyes are lost what is this So 20 years back, it was like an enigma. You had to break through, like you know, like flax, femtolaser-assisted cataract surgery. You had to tell patients five years back, but now patients are asking. So the sooner you dive into it, the better it is. ICL, IPCL, LASIK, femto, PRK. There is a huge armamentarium, and believe me, it's not a big learning curve. And that is a very important part of your practice. you take care of a few things and the cornea is generally very surgeon friendly so if you know where not to do it which is less than 2% of your population rest all places you could apply your knowledge and do it so we have a very interesting sessions and some very very important speakers to enlighten us this evening back to you guys and thank you for objectively pacing it for the youthful the younger generation who are still confused coming out of residency fellowship what kind of practice to do so thank you for organizing that thank you so much sir it gives me immense pleasure now to introduce our next speaker 
The first speaker for the evening is the President-Elect of IRSI, Dr. Vinod Arora. A refractive pioneer in North India, he is the chairman of Navjyoti Eye Hospital in Dehradun. He has given multiple national and international talks. Dr. Arora also has over 50 research publications to his name. We have him on our show to speak about microkeratome versus femtosecond, start small and grow. Over to you, sir. Thank you so much, Rohan. Uh, let me share my screen first. Where are my PPTs? Just a minute. Oh, I just stopped it. So, Lizik, as uh, Dr. Mehta has rightly pointed out, has become now the uh, part of our effect, our uh, armamentarium. So you can't avoid it. You can't uh, ignore it. At least I can say, if you don't have LASIK center, you have to have a tie up with somewhere, or it's better to start your own, or you can have a group practice that depends on various factors. As, are my slides visible? Yes, sir. Okay. Thank you. So <clears throat> once you're going to start practice, the question comes, we have a lot of options with us. We have got uh, microchrome, femtosecond, we've got smile, we've got advanced surface ablation. So how to start our practice and how to grow it? Since LASIK surgery is a high investment area, the equipments are very costly, the maintenance is very costly, the CMC is very costly, the procedure charges are also very expensive. So, so how to start it? Should we get everything at the beginning? I think it's not advisable if you are not born with a silver spoon. So since it's a hard earned, earned money, you have to invest wisely and you have to look for the return also. So we are going to start with the basic concept. So what is LASIK? LASIK is creating the flap. It's a three-step procedure basically. So first you have to create a flap. The flap can be created by many ways. Then you do the eczema laser ablation and you reposition the flap. So this is a very basic, simple things, and you can easily learn it. The learning curve is very, very small, but you have to see the fine nuances of the thing. You have to be very, very aware of those things. It's not the surgical process, it's more of the machines, but you have to know your machines well. You have to know the finer things very, very well. So let us start with the corneal refractive surgery. It can be mechanical. We have a... Uh, M2 uh, keratome or we have SPK or we have other keratomes now. These are mechanical devices which can create flap. Then we have laser also which can create the flap instead of mechanical devices. It's called the femtosecond laser. Then there are procedures like flapless procedure is smile and flapless and capless procedure that is called advanced surface ablation. So there are a lot of things our surgical laboratorium. I'll just cover the first two parts. And the second two parts will be covered by uh, subsequent speakers. So basically, you have to understand what is a mechanical keratome is. So it's a sort of uh, instrument which push, causes pressure on the cornea, which causes flattening on the cornea. A blade is there. This is an oscillating blade. It keeps on moving or oscillating, and it creates a flap. So uh, I have done uh, more experience is on Moria M2 and SPK. So I'll be discussing more on that. M2 is now not more used. If you are going to buy new one, go for the SBK. That is much advanced with much better capabilities. So these are various types of uh, microchromes that are available in the market. You can use any one, but be careful that it should have good record and it have, should have good service also. That's very, very important. Because once you buy an instrument, you have to be very sure that you get a good service also. So buy from a reliable dealer and go for an instrument you want to have, have a small training and have the feel of this thing. I think Moria is one of the very leading in this field and I have used it extensively. So I'll be covering on that one also. This is how we place a suction ring on the cornea. It creates a suction, then we move the microcrotome Microcrotome has a oscillating blade in it. So it gives a cleaner cut. And there is a hinge on the last. We don't do a free flap sort of thing. There's a hinge there and the flap, it comes back. Then the laser procedure is done. 
once our exime ablation is over, so we do a desired ablation with using a excimer laser. And this flap is reverted back. It should be aligned properly. Normally it aligns itself because of the anatomical reason, but you have to make sure it's aligned well. So it's a very simple procedure. You, it, you just see it one, you'll see it's a, it's a just peanuts. So you, but there are complications with every procedures. Of course, the complications are not common, but it's my uh, duty to inform you about the complication also, because anything you are going to do, maybe it's smile, advanced surface ablation, maybe laser, fabtolasic, but complications are with every process. Of course, the incidence keeps on decreasing once you improve the technology. But once you're going to start a surgery, you have to know the complication first. If you're going to drive a car, you know where the brake is. So you can just avoid them and if happens, you can just manage them. So incomplete cut can occur there. I will not go because the time is limited given to me. So it will not possible to cover all the procedure, but it can occur because of loss of section or is there a block of keratome by drape or there is a power failure. So can they can be button holding. Some tissue may be left there. You have taken a flap, but it's not a complete flap. There is a button of the epithelium remain there. Then there may be free cap. It may be because of various reasons, but free cap can be again managed, but you have to be careful in which corneas it can happen. Then striations can be occur there. It can be micro striation or maybe macro striations there may be there. So what are the flap complications which are common with the microchrome? It may be displacement of flap. It may be wrinkled flap. There'll be micro or macro striations. It may be interface debris there, which can cause a lot of inflammation. Then flap edema may be there because of the excessive hydration. Then flap shrinkage may be there. If you left the flap there drying for a long period, then it can cause shrinkage of the flap also. Then flap stretching may be there or maybe decentration. While you're making flap, it may not be central also. So it's not a scope had to cover all the complications, but we'll just quickly move over to femtosecond LASIK flap. So these are the various machines which are available and they're all very good. You can make it very precise, very accurate flap by using these machines. A sort of mechanical things where the uh, you are not very sure about the many things you can customize so many things here. I have used a lot of IFS 150 interlace, so I'll be talking more about that. There's no special protocol. Whatever you're doing in the LASIK, same you have to do here. Preoperative examination, workup, and surgical planning is almost same. So what happens in interlace is basically we make uh, it in, in two parts. First is a horizontal cut that's called the lamellar resection. Then there is a side cut, which comes like a, making for flap. And pocket is an optional resection used as a vent for bubbles to evacuate because it creates a lot of bubble. We know the femtosecond cleavage of the uh, layers with the creation of carbon dioxide. This causes cleavage. So this uh, gas has to go somewhere. So you provide a vent in the form of pocket. So each section has its own set of parameters. We can finally preset how much the thickness we want, how much uh, should be the side cuts there, how much should be the hinge there. So all these can be pre-programmed, pre-planned. This is the pattern we got. In, we got basically two types of pattern. It's called the raster pattern, where the movements like this and it keeps on moving this, right? Second is a spiral pattern where the starts in the center and that's gradually comes from the periphery. So pocket is, I just told you because it uh, is required. The beauty is this pocket is slightly out of the, our treatment area and the all gas comes to this pocket and is being absorbed there. So it's a releasing vent and causes decrease in the chances of opaque bubble formation. And we have side cut only features also. In some cases, uh, we require side cut also. Suppose we have to do retreatment or we have just uh, somehow got suction loss or something there, we can do side cut options only there. So this is just to compare the both process. In uh, microcotone, we mark because there is a chance of sometime free flap also. But in fact, you don't require, we place a suction ring in both the system after the suction is microchrome is much higher than compared to femtosecond laser. This laser is now creating a planar flap. It's a horizontal resection being done. In microchrome, we adjust microchrome head in the groove 
and it slides itself forward, creating a flap. It takes back, so the flap is created. Once is the femtosecondary flap, second is the mechanical or microcontrol flap. So the process is always same. Only thing femtosecond provides us more of automation. And naturally after the laser treatment, we have to reposition the flap. The technique is almost same. Only thing difference between the two techniques is creation of flap by a laser and second is creation of flap by a mechanical method. So what is the difference between the two? Since both the things, they are doing the same thing. We are not adding anything or any, changing any feature, except we are creating flap with a lasik structure, laser structure. So basically we know that on the cornea, peripheral fibers contribute to stack. These are very, very important. And minimize cutting of the deeper fibers can be occurred. So microcrotome doesn't cut in a very straight way. It causes something like this. It's a wavy that's a, it's deep in the periphery with poor diameter and centration control are not there. While with femto laser, we just got a planar flap. Its thickness is almost same everywhere. The side cuts are made. So this is an OCT of a femto flap. We intended to have a 90 micron and we can see it's 90 micron everywhere, almost 90 micron everywhere. But once we do a microcrotome, we intended to do a 160 micron flap. Of course, we don't do like this now, maybe around 100, even uh, 90 micron or 120 micron, 130 microns. This we are using nowadays. But for the sake of clarity, just I just have this slide. So we can see the variability. Here the 179, here the 155. So there's a lot of variability between the thickness of flap. It's not a planar flap. Second advantage with femto laser is that the hinge is outside optical zone. So it's a eight millimeter zoria, but we got a lot of optical zone that's much, much clear. Hinge is not interfering. It's a nine millimeter zone, but hinge is interfering here. So we get a clear area, which is very less compared to a femtolasic. So it's like a D-shaped incision is there. Uh, hinge is interfering. So we can't do ablation on this area. We have to choose the central area only. So we get a less area when we use a microcrotome compared to femtolasic. Then there is another option. We can have elliptical flap also. Suppose you've got a cylindrical number at 180 degree. Naturally, the ablation is going to be more on the, the, that axis. So we can have a uh, elliptical area. That means the, this area is increased on that side. So our hinge goes little away from this place. And we got a much bigger area than we got in a round uh, ablation, a round flap, if we may. The another advantage of femtosecond LASIK is that we can adjust this flap inside. That means beveled in. Instead of going uh, bevel, instead of keeping flap on the top, the flap edge go inside. So it provides much better strength to the flap. There's less chances of displacement and overall strength of biomechanical stability also increases. So that's the advantage. In a risk case, we can choose up to 150 mic, uh, degree of this uh, bevel. While in microcotone, it is less than 90, maybe 70, maybe 30, 45. So that causes slippage of the flap is much more common in microcotone. But here is the much provided strength. And it also provides a strength to the flap also. So our biomechanicals, that also improves a lot. So post-operative regime and femtolasic, since we are using a laser energy also, so it uses a little stronger stride. Rest, that too initially for 24 to 48 hours. But the rest of the post-operative regime is unchanged from the standard LASIK post-operative care. Same care we have to do here. So what are the advantages with femtolasic? There's enhanced flap creation customization. We can customize size. We can customize thickness of the flap. And we can position the hinge. We can have it on uh, nasal, uh, uh, this temporal side. We can have it in horizontal side. Even we can make on the lower side also. Not on the nasal side, but all other three sides. But in uh, microchrome, we have got a fix. Either we can make it on the horizontal or we can make in a top uh, temporal side only. 
So we got change in between, but here we got option we can change wherever we want to have our range. <clears throat> then flap is uh, more biomechanically stable. And uh, of course, the, we have uh, option of side cut angles we can change and we can have the elliptical flaps. Faster visual recovery occur, that occurs in both basically, but it's much better healed. Then accessible safety. There's a lot of safety in femtolysic. The reason is if anything goes wrong, suppose there is a suction loss or there is any problem, you can just, you can just uh, stop the procedure and then redo it. Except one or two things, you can always redo the procedure. While in microectomy, if anything goes wrong, most of the time you have to abandon the procedure and have to do in a later stage, either uh, you do uh, advanced surface ablation, or a lot of things there if, if complication occurs there. Uh, meanwhile, we have to discuss also some of the complications of femtolysic. It's not a complication free. Of course, the complications are much, much smaller if you compare to microcritone, and most of them are manageable. I just named them since we have to cover in short time. So it's a very safe procedure, like we know, very safe procedure, and femto added become much more safer. But we have to be ready for complication also. We should know about that. The best thing is the preparedness. Subconjectural hemorrhage is very, very common. It's not a complication for us, but it's a complication for patient. So you have to tell the patient in advance that they may be subconjectural hemorrhage. They may be red spot. That may persist even up to 20 to 25 days. Sometimes the patient gets alarmed by this thing because they can see only this thing. So you have to just foretell them that that will be there. So there's nothing to worry about this thing. Then there may be damage applanation cone. Of course, we have to observe it well. There may be debris on the ablation cone. We have to take care for that. Then, like any refractive procedure, there may be complications, like there may be suction loss. That can occur in uh, microcotone also, but here also. The only advantage is there, we can redo it in the same sitting. We just take out the things, we adjust the parameters, and we restart the process. So we can, if there is suction loss, we can always redo it. Then vertical gas back through is the thing is the only thing where we have to abandon the process and we because it's a sort of reverse of button hole. That means there is a hole in the flap and the gas comes out from that flap. So we can't do on that one. We just leave the flap there because everything is intact. It's not a flap yet. We have not lifted it. We leave it everything there, let that thing heal. And after some, some time, we can do the advanced surface ablation. Horizontal gas throw is common if you do it on your uh, flap. Uh, goes to the out, outer boundaries, I mean to say it's very close to limbus, then there may be horizontal gas breakthrough. If you can ask the patient to wait for half an hour, suppose you got a session, you do four or five cases, by that time, it's most of the time it absorbs. And if there is a very small gas, it's not going to gas bubble, it's not going to interfere with your procedure. Opaque bubble layer is very, very common in uh, femtolysic. It's a, as a rule, it occurs and Usually it clears up within a few minutes. If there is hard wheel, it may take a little more time, but we have to change the parameters if we are getting it repeatedly. So we can change the parameters and it can be corrected. Applanation technique is uh, called a soft applanation technique. Bubbles I just discussed you. If there is a bubble, we have to, if it's too much, then it may interfere with your treatment. If there is a single bubble or two, then you can go ahead. But otherwise you have to wait for half an hour, it will go off. Hinged tear is not common, but can very rarely occur. Then decenter flap can occur if your eyes is moved or the patient is not very cooperative. But the advantages is here, if the flap decentration is a little bit, it's not going to cause you any reflective surprises or any change. Unlike a smile, if there is a little decentration, then there will be change in the reflection also. But here, since the flap is not contributing to the reflection, so it's not going to matter much. If it's too decenter, then you can do it in another way. I mean, say so you can redo it and make it central. Since everything is there intact, epithelium is there, flap is not lifted. So there's no change. You can always do it again. So that's the beauty of uh, frame to second laser that it forgives your complication also, and you can manage them also. But that's not possible with the me mechanical keratome. So just to sum up, there, this is a more precise flap. There may be chances of elliptic. There, uh, advantage of elliptical flap, their choice of hinge position, then inverted side cut. That means bevel then you can make it there. So just comparing the two things, if we compare uh, both the things, the learning curve in microcotone is a little short. In fact, a second is a little longer, but not too much. 
you have to learn the few tricks and you can master the things then customization in microcutone is limited while it's fully uh, customizable in femto second laser lot of variations there it's a fixed thickness you can use 90 micron 130 microns you get a fixed blades so you can't change it you want to have 100 it's not possible then uh, hinge position is fixed either you can have temporal or you can have superior while in femto second you can have superior temporal or nasal whatever you want or edge lie on the blade that means bevel out in uh, femto it's a bevel in that's a more biomechanically stronger condition then the size of flap is a limited choice you have to choose the various rings and only those rings can be used and the, do you have a limited choice but in this you can customize the flap size you want to have nine millimeter you can do it you want to have 9.15 or 9.25 you can change it even if you want to eight millimeter perspirable ablation you can do it also then flap stability is much better and biomechanics of course are much better but what are the advantages of microcutome? First thing is it's economical to buy and very space saving. For femtosecond is a big machine. You have to require more space. Then uh, initial cost is very, very high. Second is economical to run microcutome because the cost running cost is very, very low. Uh, you can have CMC, you don't have CMC, doesn't matter much. But femtosecond, you have to pay huge amount for CMC also. Then economical pro procedure. Here you're using blades. While in femto second, you have to use a uh, PI, which are given much costly. It may be eight to 10,000 per, per eye. So that's an additional cost. So if you consider the economics, microcotone makes much better sense because it's very economical and you can do all the procedure. Femto second is a better alternative to microcotone, but it's not essential to start initially. Refractive results of both the procedure are very good. It doesn't matter in femto second or microcotone, they are almost same. Electrical flaps now with newer microcotone like SBK, you have electrical flaps also. Then with newer microcotone, the planar play, jo flaps, they are almost planar now. It's not perfect, but it's almost planar now. So you're getting much better flaps what we were getting earlier with earlier uh, microcotones. So, so the and visual recovery is little early in microcotone because here in femtosecond, we have used energy. It takes a few more hours, but that's almost same. So what is happening when the femtosecond provides a lot of uh, benefits to us, microcutome technology has also improved a lot. We are getting much quality, better uh, microcutomes now that provides us much qual better quality of flaps also. So the flaps are now planar also there. You can have the elliptical flaps also. So some of the advantage of femtoseconds are already there in microcutome technology. I think in coming future, we'll be much more better. So in uh, what is happening? This I have already covered. So what is happening? Uh, there's an improvement in every section of refractive surgery. We have a of surgical, the PRK was ne much neglected earlier. Now we have got advanced surface ablation. It's, it's a new avatar, it's a much better film. Microcrotomes have improved a lot. Femto second laser has improved a lot. I think smile is also again improving a lot. Newer companies are coming. They are coming with better machines. So some of the limitation of smiles, they are also taking out. So nothing is going out. Everything is going to be stay here. So my advice is, if you are going to start a LASIK center, especially for the budding ophthalmologist or the young ophthalmologist, where finances is a big problem, once you start a new center, because your revenue is not there initially. So basic things you require is examiner laser, you require a pachymeter, you require a topographer, then you start with the microcrotome. And of course, once you come in, uh, your practice starts picking up, you can always add other things. You can add femto laser, you can add smile if you feel like. So these things can be added later. So these are the basic things. I think microcutome is the best choice for a budding surgeon or for an ophthalmologist who's going to start LASIK center. So it gives you peace of mind, relax, earn first, then grow big. So you start, the theme is you start slow, small, and then grow big. So that's all I just wanted to say. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you so much. An excellent talk. Uh, I would like to bring in uh, Dr. Manchu sir and Dr. Vardhaman here. Uh, one question that we all have is that uh, how many percentage of patients come to you and demand a femtosecond laser rather than you deciding what is the choice of flap creation? Vardhaman, over to you. Yeah, thank you, sir. I think, uh, first of all, uh, 
I think thanks to the youthful RSI and our very young president, Dr. Iman Shusar, for the kind invite to be here. Uh, so I think it is a very pertinent question. Uh, uh, I think it depends on a lot of factors, but I think in today's generation of patients, they are very well aware and they are quite updated. So I will say that more often or not, they are already aware about what all technologies are there in the in um, available in India or abroad. They also are aware which hospitals have which kind of technology overall. More and more people are definitely coming and asking about specific technologies to us now, including Smile or Contura. But what is important for us to actually uh, understand is that it is not what the patient is asking for. You have to actually understand from the whole analysis, what technology should be the best for that particular patient. So maybe if the patient is coming and asking uh, you for a smile procedure, but if you feel that compared to smile, maybe doing a surface ablation is better procedure for him, then this is something that you have to really work upon. Uh, but definitely, I think more and more patients are coming. If I have to put in percentage, I think in, in my setting, uh, I will say that almost 70 to 75 percent patients are already aware about all techniques and already inclined towards one or the other techniques before they have come to me. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, thanks, Vardhman. The answer is very clear on. This is an internet driven business, more or less. They, they are all those people who have read a lot and they want to do the cheapest possible thing. So there is somebody who is advertising that blade free. He's doing PRK, surface treatment. So it's not femtosecond. But so this is how it is. Instead of not starting, a keratote is definitely a good option to start with. It is how much confidence you have in your own self, what you can tell the patient on your own and make them aware that this is a good proposition for you. Nobody has ever lost eyes because of this. Now the newer microkeratones, as Dr. Vinod Arora was saying, Getting a buttonhole is almost an impossibility with the new Moria microkeratome. We have seen a buttonhole, we have seen a free flap, but free flap is a lot more manageable than a buttonhole. The planar flaps also are better. And if you will be surprised at times to see that the flaps are actually very nice with a blade in certain cases, then with a femto. So you have to be confident and tell the patient. And of course, they save money. So yes, femto, no question, would be the best answer that you can have. Having said that, don't feel extremely inferior if you don't have one, because the idea in people's mind which has been given is blade means like the razor blade or the surgical surgeon's blade. It's not that. It's a very highly sophisticated microkeratome. It's a beautiful machine. The first time I saw in the US in 91, I was bowled over that. What a lovely piece of machinery somebody has made. And so it's it's nice. It's, it's excellent and... Uh, I would encourage patients. So, Dr. Arora, you agree with me that the complication rates with the microkeratome has gone down tremendously? Yeah, newer microkeratomes are much, much better. So, they have taken a lot of complications and we have a lot of confidence in these machines. So, complication at rate has drastically down. I think uh, that's that's one thing. It's improving a lot and taking almost coming with, at par with femtolizid. Of course, uh, there are some uh, advantages of femtolizid definitely. But as we are talking about the young ophthalmologists who are going to start the practice, I think their first step should be go for ventolizing. Of course, they can add up everything. If you've got a lot of options, that's, that's much better. But that requires a lot of money also. Once you earn it, your center starts earning, your volume pickups, you can add anything. But if you're going to start basic center where your volume is zero, and from zero you have to start, then I think microcutome makes your first choice. Then you can go for femtolizic, then you can go for a smile also, then other things can be added. And basically, you can start with a simple topography machines. But there are a lot of things there, tomography, topography, and a lot of things are coming. But these are very good. This helps you in few cases. But once you are going to start, you have to look for the finances also. It's, it's good for busy surgeons, like person surgeons who are doing for years. They can have everything. They can provide you everything. And patient loves option also. But sometimes it's not on the other way also. So if you get one thing, you will stick to that thing. Once you build up your practice, then naturally you can keep on adding everything. You can add a femtolizic, you can add a smile. That comes on the second stage. That's that's my take home messages. Hi, Gaurav. Good to see you. Good Welcome. to see you.
good to see everybody yeah sorry i'm late yeah. stuck in traffic so oh, sir the question was now in fact i would like your perspective also from a tier 2 uh, town point of view that uh, how many percentage of your patients actually come and ask you about the way you create your flap whether you want to do an nk on them or in fact demand an fs from you uh rohan is that directed to me yes or, sir okay so the thing is that nowadays patients uh, who come to us are mostly already you know they've kind of they're looking for something you know they don't walk in saying that please tell me what all kinds of lasik are there they've already done their research and they come you know many of them have researched about contura so most people have researched and they've done research google they've done youtube and they are already influenced a lot and it becomes very difficult sometimes to you know educate them about a procedure which they might actually be eligible for or maybe better for them so they would come and if you you know so many of them come asking for smile for example some people come come asking for contura lasik some of them even come asking for uh, you know all laser prk and stuff you know so frankly um, i think today's patients are mostly quite well educated and aware and uh, they are research so i think the total profile has changed you know till about 5 10 years back people didn't know what lasik was they used to wonder what do they actually do they had no concept of a laser correction frankly you know so you had to tell them that we are going to do this and we are, they are used to think that we are going to put a lens in the eye which you know you have to tell them ki nahi lens kuch nahi lagega and all that no, now it's totally changed now the patient who comes to you is fairly well educated about what he is looking for and sometimes it's difficult to change their mind as well yeah so sir your solution for a youngster how would a youngster who cannot afford to straight away put in all these machines how does that youngster deal with a patient like that so ron i think i am sure you guys have discussed this before but i think it's it's foolish to actually put up a machine yourself today you know in our times when we started doing me myself and dr roda started doing lasik there was no lasik machine in dehradun and not even from here till delhi and uh, you know so there was no choice if we wanted to do refractive surgery some of us had to get together and put together a machine today i think every city has lasik centers which allow people to visit which have machines it is no longer economically viable to put up a machine for your own center unless you have a practice where you are doing like 50 50 lasik patients or 100 eyes minimum per month because the logistics and the you know the cost of run, running the machine and everything is so much and frankly with the number of machines available now break evens i would think that only 20% if and maybe i'm exaggerating 20 25% centers will be breaking even or in profit you know so it's probably more useful for any any youngster to not invest a penny on on a lasik machine just have the diagnostics and uh, utilize one of the many centers which may be allowing them to go and operate and learn to how to operate and when you have a reasonable volume maybe you know you are doing say 10 15 20 cases a month then think in terms of putting up your own machine uh, there's nothing wrong in that once you are doing great you can always put up a machine but to begin with it's more economically viable less pressures and very sensible because otherwise you buy a machine and you don't have the numbers you are loss making there's so much stress and you know i don't think it's a good thing yes reminds me of the photograph that dr roda had put right at the end of his talk of a baby sleeping calmly when you haven't invested absolutely yeah you know sick so, down i think that's a very good thing like somebody in bombay doesn't even have to think twice bombay or pune or for that right. matter any of the big cities you can just visit one of the centers you know pay them their fee and use their machine it's so much better i think the problem is in the smaller towns yes we are we have got limited uh, ophthalmologists and uh, people are not willing to share or people are not cooperative that way sometimes that can cause problem otherwise sharing is the best option nothing like that absolutely Great. So we'll move on to the next topic. I'll uh, ask Dr. Anshika, please, to introduce uh, Dr. Vardhaman. Thank you, Dr. Rohan. So our next speaker is the director of Asian Eye Hospital, Pune. Dr. Vardhaman is the first Indian to undergo a one-year fellowship in advanced refractive surgery from Greece from the father of LASIK and epilasik, along with another fellowship at Bascom Palmer Eye Institute, Miami. Dr. Kankaria has won many national and international papers in various conferences and has many publications under his hat. Dr. Vardhaman also has also been a pioneer in teaching many students under his fellowship program. Here we have him to tell us about choosing ideal technology for the ideal patient. Over to you, sir. Thank you very much. Uh, am I audible? Yes, sir. Thank you. So first and foremost, uh, I would like to thank the entire committee of uh, youthful 
uh, and RSI, our president, uh, Dr. Imanshu sir, uh, Dr. Goro, and uh, Dr. Arora sir, everybody who is here. I think it's a great platform for all the youngsters to gain knowledge at the beginning of their career. Uh, wish we had could have had something like that. And I think it was, I think Dr. Goro is also a brainchild that has brought in um, such an uh, amazing venture. Uh, so friends, as we had uh, this like a preemptive discussion about uh, having your own setup or not, I think uh, I would really agree with Dr. Gaurav when he said that it is better that instead of uh, investing on your own, you can take access at a variety of centers. And one of the reasons I will say that is also uh, highlighted in my talk is basically then you can have actually a variety of technologies under your belt and you can choose uh the best patient for the best technology and probably take access for that technology and then do the surgery for that day. so this is precisely what i'm going to talk to you about uh, so friends we all know that refractive surgery of today is a dream realized it these are definitely the surgeries to eliminate and decrease dependency on glasses and contact lenses they have become very big fight with inmate procedures they are currently completely bladeless now also flapless with smile uh, with a great amount of valve effect and uh, the recent ACR survey has demonstrated that the satisfaction it takes of this procedure as a lifestyle modifying surgery has been the highest amongst all the elective surgeries which is close to 97 uh, percent so refractive surgery has actually clocked almost a century if you really see because the first ever posterior rk which was done in japan by professor sato was in back in almost 1920 and now we are in 2020 2021 so in this almost a century uh, journey of refractive surgical uh, different innovations, uh, you have seen that there are a variety of technologies which have actually come. Some of them have stood the test of time. Some have actually have managed uh, with the journey with time. Uh, however, now as we stand today, definitely now there are a variety of technologies that we have as armamentarium. And the thing that we have to understand, and I would like to make this uh, mainly for also our young surgeons who would like to become a refractive surgeon that if you want to do a refractive surgery it is not that you become a lasik surgeon i think if you want to be a true refractive surgeon you should be able to have understanding and expertise about variety of technologies which are there and customize the decision for choosing the best solution for that given patient just to give you a couple of examples this was one of the patient who was referred to us for the post prk haze as you can see uh, although the laser was done on a good machine uh, for not very high diameter, but the patient was actually a policeman, a traffic policeman. So with a very excessive exposure of sunlight, uh, he underwent PTK with mitomycin C, and as you can see, he has actually uh, he has actually done pretty well. But these are the kind of scenarios that we should try to avoid in our patients. Again, another patient who is an athlete was a football player, but uh, after about three months of his femoral LASIK had a small injury and you can see here he has a very very small displacement so he required a flap deposition and now he's of course doing pretty well so it's very crucial that we don't stick to only one procedure we actually understand what is best for our patients and this entire armamentarium is something that we should understand now which includes corneal laser procedures which involves microkeratome lasik femoral lasik now also topographic added femoral lasik procedures smile procedures and advanced circulations when it comes to lens procedures, we have to know the fecic lenses, fecic lens implants, and those minority of patients where nothing else is possible. A minority of these people can be still helped with refractive lens exchange as well. Uh, so when it comes to my protocols, I stick to corneal laser procedures uh, for myopia less than nine day afters, hyperopia less than five day afters, and astigmatism less than five day afters, uh, if the corneal parameters are deemed suitable for such a laser vision correction. As we all know, current uh, laser vision correction technologies can be flap-based, uh, including the microkeratome LASIK, femoral LASIK, or contura, or they can also be flap-based, such as advanced surface ablation or smile procedure itself. So, uh, going further to decide on which technology to use for this patient, uh, if the patient already has an excellent quality of vision, has very good nighttime quality of vision and does not have uh, significant aberrations, definitely the reference optimized platforms of today. Uh, are excellent solutions that can be achieved with even LASIK, uh, micro, with microkeratome as well, femtosecond LASIK, advanced surface ablation, as well as with SMILE. But if you see the patient does have a lot of ablations, especially coming from the cornea, there is a topographic asymmetry or a stigmatism that you see, then a topographic guided treatment is truly a great solution for these patients to have. And I think different guided treatments overall have died down uh, as far as the choice of procedures have 
concern and they have been taken over largely by the topographic added treatments now. Uh, for patients who are not deemed suitable for corneal laser procedures, especially for people who have more than nine diopters of myopia, more than five diopters of hyperopia, with uh, of course with the uh, possibility of having good anterior chamber depth, uh, or the patients who have probably lower end metropias, but the corneas are not suitable for lasers uh, and have enough anterior chamber depth. Faking lens implants are a beautiful, beautiful solution, one of my most favorite procedures to perform. And if the anterior chamber depth is insufficient, then of course um, the refractive lens exchange becomes one of the scenarios. Uh, for myself, what I do is mine has become my procedure of choice and first choice currently with all its advantages. So a very uh, a common or typical patient when it comes when he comes with uh, this kind of myopic astigmatism, which is let us say moderate with very very good uh, corneal parameters that we are looking at, uh, my first choice will be smile. Why smile currently? Because uh, we have seen that the smile actually is a great marriage, and the advantages of both advanced surface ablation in the form of being flapless with slightly better stability. And the advantages of the lamella procedures in terms of the fast recovery, completely penless course with less amount of recreation and no possibility of haze has made SMILE as a great, great solution for majority of our patients. Especially today when you have a lot of people who are computer users, they already have some pre-existing dry air. So SMILE obviously becomes a great solution here because in SMILE, as you know, you are actually taking out the lenticule from much below the subepithelial nerve nexus, thus preserving the corneal nerves much better than with lacing. You will be creating a flap, so you'll be creating a flap and then... I think Dr. Rupal has to uh, probably mute herself. No? Yes, so basically, um, as we see for because of these reasons, there is also less induction of corneal neuropathy and much better preservation of corneal sensations with smile. If you look at this uh, study, which was published by Dan Einstein, in which he has actually compared 16 studies of LASIK and about seven publications from smile. And he has shown that after LASIK, there is a sudden drop in corneal sensations, which goes to less than 10%. And it takes a long time for it to recover. As against in SMILE, actually the corneal sensitivity reduces by only 30 or 40% initially and also is known to recover much, much faster. This corneal sensitivity restoration is also reflected by improvement also of your dry air parameters. Both objective as well as subjective parameters have been seen to recover much, much faster with SMILE. That's why for majority of my patients, currently my choice is smile. So let us say that for patients who have 1.50 to 8 diopters of myopia, especially if they have a pre-existing mild dryer, and of course, if they are in contact sport, I would like to go with the flapless procedures. Uh, current uh, patients in which I avoid to do smile are patients who have low myopia of less than 1.50 diopters. Of course, patients who have hyperopia, we cannot do smile currently, but patients who have pure astigmatism or very significant astigmatism more than 2.50, I do not choose to do smile procedure on them, such as this patient. So look at this, one of the patients who was a 28 year old, uh, a 25 year old male patient who came with this myopic astigmatism with a very nice symmetric bow tie, but high astigmatism as you can see here. So in such key patients, I have actually seen that the results of topoguided femtolasic are actually better than the smile procedure. Similarly, if you see uh, this girl who has a pure astigmatism, in this case, of course, Performing a smile, uh, performing a topoguided treatment will be the procedure of choice, uh, especially for patients who are hyperopic. Hyperopia is especially important when it comes to take a call, basically because as against any other uh, LASIK, femtolasic, in topoguided femtolasic, the hyperopic ablations are going to be bang on the visual axis. So that's why the issues with angle cover and other things don't happen, and hyperopic treatments are always best treated with topoguided treatments. Uh, so, of course, there is a, a role of uh, femtosec and uh, LASIK procedures as well as mechanical microkeratome. Overall, if you ask me in general, femtosec and lasers are definitely my preferred choice of flap making as compared to mechanical microkeratomes. Mechanical microkeratomes of today are absolutely excellent as we have seen uh, with the talk of Dr. Arora sir. And we do use it for many patients who don't afford femtosec and LASIK. Uh, and especially I use it over and above femtosecond LASIK if there is a pre-existing corneal scar because the femtosecond lasers do not penetrate the corneal scars very, very well. So this was just to give you an example of hyperopia. So in hyperopia, when you treat the topographic added treatment, 
the treatment is going to be more on visual access and that is the one that gives rise to much better quality of vision. So my indications for topoguided treatments are people who have myopic astigmatisms more than 2.5, people who have hyperopia, pure astigmatism. Of course, I avoid it on patients who already are prone to trauma because of treatment, such as being in police or if they are in defense, uh, patients who already have existing significant dry eye, and of course, patients who have epithelial basement dystrophy because that can lead to much, much higher chance of epithelial growth after the flap creation. Now, those are other minority of patients who are not deemed uh, correct for lamellar procedures, and those are the people in which I take advantage of undoing having uh, surface ablation procedure. These people are typically when I'm not very, very happy with topography. So when the topography is not abnormal, but it is certainly uh, some uh, some yellow flags or you have a mildly variant of normal topography, this is a, these are the kind of patients where I would not like to create a flap. There are a variety of studies which are actually shown in contralateral eyes that eyes with similar topographies when have undergone PRK versus LASIK, the LASIK eye has actually ended up having ectasia. The PRK eye, even after 10 years of follow, actually have continued to give good outcomes. So this is another uh, patient who has uh, this inferior asymmetry, fortunately has uh, low myopia. So these are the patients in which I would still go ahead with the advanced surface ablation. Uh, again, this patient has excellent thickness, as you can see, but I'm not very comfortable in doing a lamellar cut on patients who already have these steep corneas. So in this case, uh, this cornea is overall okay. There is no posterior elevation, but the corneal steepness is about 49 capitals. So again, these are the people in which I would like to still go ahead and perform a surface ablation procedure because it is less invasive. Of course, you're going to come up with certain people who have more than just a minor variation in topography, such as this patient who is already a suspect keratoconus patient. If such a patient comes to you, it is very crucial that you first look at the stability of, uh, uh, to look at overall how is the situation of the cornea, look at at least six months follow up to see that it is not really worsening too much. And if it is six months to one year fairly stable, then you can perform what is called as a PRK extra procedure in which you do an advanced surface ablation with a half fluence cross linking, provided that you are not ablating on cornea too much. And we have, I think, uh, almost a series of now almost 86 patients uh, with such topographies in which we have done PRK extra that are decently good outcomes and uh, one of them has the full blown ectasia. Uh, is there a difference between the way you do at, uh, advanced surface ablation if you are doing it with PRK, MMC, epilasic, or LASIK? So we had we had uh, we had published a study uh, back in 2014. This was uh, this was almost a, a three-year follow-up study of patients who underwent contralateral surface ablation, different protocols, and we have seen we have seen that whatever method you are uh, happy with, whether it is LASIK, epilasic, or PRK, MMC, the outcomes are going to be fairly similar. So indication for me to perform advanced surface ablation is typically that the corneas are uh, are near normal, but there are minor uh, uh, yellow flags there. If you have a steeper cornea, if you have a minorly thinner cornea, but I don't go beyond six diopters currently when it comes to advanced surface ablations, especially for people who want to do uh, defense and army. Of course, this becomes one of the procedures of choice. And patients who have pre existing dry eye, this is another possibility for them as uh, as with spine procedure. Of course, you have to rule out that the patients are not deloid formers, so you have to ask about the history of their healing after any injury. And there is no stem cell deficiency, such as people who have had long history of VKC, and of course, occupations prone to UV exposure, such as the police officer, the, the uh, traffic policeman that we have seen. So this is another very interesting patient we had seen the other day. You can see the patient came with six, six vision with minus three diopters of spherical, uh, uh, spherical error. And what we have seen is vision was excellent, topography was good, but you can see that there are signs of epithelial basement dystrophy. So these are the people you should avoid to cut a flap, including smile. You should not cut a lamellar cut. You should always go with surface ablation because surface ablation will also treat this epithelial basement membrane dystrophy. So for those patients who are not suitable for corneal lasers, as we have discussed before, of course, the lens-based solutions are excellent. Fakic lenses such as ICL are outstanding uh, solutions. And I think for even young surgeons, I think probably they are um, they are very easy for you to learn. You should, uh, if you become well-versed with FACO surgery, it will become very easy for you to perform the ICL procedure. So this was another uh, case report our team had published in which this was like a nine or 10 years of follow-up for patient who had minus 9.75 diopters of spherical equivalent, had one eye LASIK and one eye star ICL. So when the patient uh, came back after nine years, 
in the eye, which had basically he had request to minus two, and he was not very happy about quality of vision. As against in the other eye of ICL, he was still able to see 20, 20, 30, 20, 30 to 20, 25. That patient was very, very happy with the ICL in long term. So, of course, when would you choose this uh, option is for all the people who have very high emetropia, such as in this patient, or patients who have relatively lower emetropia but thinner cornea. So, this cornea of 480 microns, but emetropia more than minus seven diopters is due for phicic lenses. Again, coming to this uh, eye, which is in which we have seen that uh, the patient has very thin cornea, it's like 458 micron cornea was already suspect keratoconus. We have to look at the overall stability of his cornea over six months or one year. But if everything seems fine, then he is a great candidate again for phacic lenses such as ICL, IPCL, RIL, whichever is the procedure of choice for you. One second. So basically, there are a variety of lenses. We have had opportunity to use each and every of uh, this fakic lens, including ICL, IPCL, Actrail, as well as RL. All of them are great solutions. So whichever your patient can afford, you can go ahead and implant them. That's not a problem. So there are also minority of such people who have emetropia beyond 20 diopters, which is the range for your EVO ICL. So if you have a uh, emetropia which is well beyond those uh, 20 diopters, such as in this case, the spherical equivalent is uh, 22 to 24 diopters, either you can go with the Indian thickic lenses because those are the ones who will be able to uh, accommodate such a high emetropia, or you can perform what is called as a a bioptics procedure in which you do the star EVO ICL along with either LASIK or SMILE, whatever is your procedure of choice, um, in phase manner, in which first you create a flap, you perform the ICL on the same sitting, then you wait it out for another uh, two weeks or so, refract the patient again and perform LASIK uh, after about two weeks' time. So this is the procedure which has been used a lot in the US especially because till the time the toric ICLs were USFDA approved, for all patients who had high emetropia with astigmatism, they used to do uh, the spherical ICL with uh, the astigmatism correction by LASIK procedure with biotics. So again, coming to uh, people who are beyond 40 years of age and who don't have enough uh, entry chamber depth, uh, refractive lens exchange becomes a great solution. This is an interesting case. You can see the patient had very high, uh, uh, so this patient had high myopic astigmatism. The patient already had a suspect keratoconus, was low entry chamber depth of 2.67 millimeters, and had also multiple lattice degenerations in both eyes. So I think this is just to make you understand that some of the patients you have to learn to reject. So it is not necessary that you operate on each and every patient that comes to you. You have to learn to reject patients. So this is one of the patients in which you would not like to intervene, probably do barrage laser for him, follow him up for the future, and make sure that you do not intervene for this patient. So in conclusion, I would like to just tell all the young doctors that as we discussed, it is not necessary that you buy all these equipments yourself. I think it is necessary you have your own diagnostic tools with you. You have to have access to these technologies, but you have to learn all these technologies so that you are able to give the best possible solution to your own patients. So these new techniques have really made a spectrum of refractive surgeries much wider, much more accurate, and customizing the decision is what I would like to really stress on. I would like to thank again IRSI and also the youthful wing of IRSI for giving me this kind opportunity to be with you today. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for your wonderful talk, uh, Dr. Vajaman. Taking up where we left off before your conversation, so we mentioned that on the earlier days, uh, patients used to come with uh, after researching on the net. But in, how do you convince them in case they need another choice of procedure for the refractive power? Yeah. So I think um, uh, as we discussed in current times, this is a very relevant question because more uh, more uh, often or not, uh, if you are especially in your metro, uh, these patients will come to you with certain preconceived notions that they have. Uh, so you have to spend more chair time with them for sure because they already have certain very solid uh, concepts in their minds that they are not very easily willing to change. But you have to spend time with them. You have to make them understand by like as compared to what they are uh, they are wanting to undergo why this particular procedure is better for them. This has happened with us a lot of times because, for example, if somebody has come for smile and has very, very high astigmatism, let us say 3, 3.5 diopters of astigmatism. So we tell them that if you're very keen, we can still perform smile, but of course the accuracy of treatment uh, will be much, much better if you undergo to go at a center racing procedure 
we also tell them and show them certain times evidences from the literature showing that this is how we choose our patients so the patients uh, have to believe that whatever decision that you are taking for the patient is in their best interest and this is one of the other reasons that you should be well versed or all young doctors have to be well versed with all technologies because otherwise the patient will feel that because there is only one technique or two techniques in the hospital this is why you are kind of forcing him to undergo only one technology over the other so yeah but you have to spend more time with those patients and show them some uh, proof of evidence something thank you so much uh, i'd like to uh, ask dr rupal ma'am she's just joined us for her comments on on uh, how does she go ahead and choose uh, what technology to use you know for a particular patient in a particular case dr rupal ma'am hello yes ma'am you're audible yeah, yeah. Uh, so thank you rohan and i'm sorry for joining in late um what i would what i normally do is try and see which one would work the best for them and then uh, try and counsel them in a way where uh, i'm leading them to choose that particular procedure if it's going to be the one which is going to work the best for their uh, their requirement so it's very easy to actually um make a person know what is good for them if you sincerely believe in it and then you should actually spell out the pros and cons of what would otherwise uh, the other techniques where it would have limitations in case you feel that a particular technique is the only one that should be used in that particular patient now that's not the case in most patients most patients can do well with even three or four different types of techniques and it would then boil down to whether the person wants the safest procedure whether they want uh, to make sure that they get the perfect result or whether they want uh, to uh, go in for something which is the in thing to do or that somebody else has been very happy about it and then they want to do so then you can just give them all the pros and cons of each and every technique and then you should then allow them to choose and then they choose it depending upon their budget their knowledge their uh, requirement so i actually leave the decision on the patient i only drive them to a particular procedure if i feel that that particular procedure is the uh, the the best way to go for that particular patient all of wisdom then customer is the king <laughs> um, so dr nikhil if i may yeah rohan yeah i would just say this that it is very important what you are confident of your body language will reflect that if you haven't done a particular procedure well you are not very confident you will not imbibe that kind of confidence to tell the patient that you are going to be doing that so you be very sure what you are saying and you can always lead the pathway leaving it to the patient after ex explaining everything about every multifocal gaurav will also admit end of the day they'll tell they know what to do but they're going to tell you doc sahab aap jo kahenge wo they will pass on the box box to you they very easily pass on the box to you your call doc so tomorrow they can blame you they have decided but they want it from your mom so you walk into that trap very easily and that's exactly what they want they you walk into the trap they nahi nahi doc sahab aap hi decide kijiye sab sunne ke baad so either their neighbor has made the decision for them somebody who they are close to has done this procedure nahi nahi i want this only that's how it works or what you are confident with And with Dr. Rupal Shah, so she decides whatever she wants. No questions asked. She nobody dares to ask her questions. I think there's one. You really think so? <laughs> I think there's one more way. I just tell the patient that every eye is a unique. It's not a, a standard item where we can give a one procedure to all or one size fits to all. So your eye is special. It's a unique one, and we have to give the best what is possible for your eyes, not for other size. So a patient wants a smile. If a patient wants femto, if a patient wants uh, say fake eye or anything, but what we think is better, we have to tell them this is the best suited for your eye. Now it's your choice if you want to have it or you want to go for what you have heard here. So I think most of the patient agrees on that. I say the doctor should be the deciding one, unless you got a similar options, then it's okay. But once you don't have a similar option, suppose a patient is good for a smile, then we have to tell and ask motivate him to go for a smile only. 
It's not that we can just leave it to a patient to go for that. So we tell her, your eyes are unique. It's a special one. It requires a special treatment. And that this is the special treatment for your eye. So then the patient gets convinced most of the time. Okay. So Dr. Nikhil, as a young ophthalmologist just entered into refractive practice, how difficult do you find convincing a patient at this age? Uh, it all depends, Rohan, if the patient is already driven towards it. If the patient comes, there are a lot of patients who are already driven to get rid of their spectacles or something, then it's pretty much easy convincing them for a particular procedure. But yes, there are yet a lot of patients who would, who uh, convincing would be slightly tougher at this age uh, as compared to someone who's way more experienced when they give the word, then they're more, much more convinced. But yes, if you do put all the facts, tell the patients uh, all the what are the worst things that can happen? Tell them even what is the, you know, that this can be, what are the different complications, how they can be handled and keep everything clearly on the table. Then definitely, yes, they do get convinced at the end of the day. Okay. So last words on this, Dr. Gaurav, sir. So I think uh, we've heard it all and it's all what I, you know, it echoes my thoughts as well. But I think uh, what uh, most of us have agreed upon is that you know, coming up front clear and having confidence in what you're doing. These are the two keys. And of course, you know, if a patient is making a wrong choice, then it's always good to, you know, kind of uh, educate them on that. But uh, excellent talk by uh, Vardhaman, uh, you know, he kind of uh, made things so easy to go through. So I, I think uh, the message is loud and clear. Um, thank you all. We have our next speaker, Dr. Sonu Goel. He is the director of Anand Hospital and Eye Care Center, Jaipur. He has more than 20 years of teaching in ophthalmic practice and is the top anterior segment surgeon in the country. He specializes in complicated cataract and refractive surgeries. Dr. Goel has also had many fellowship programs where he teaches them FACO and refractive surgeries. Being a certified surgeon for ICL implantation, we had him on our show to help us take the leap for ICL implantation. Thank you. Welcome to the show, sir. Thank you, Sonu, for being there, my dear friend. I just, uh, <laughs> I'm in the middle of my OT. I'm so sorry no. for making things so late. Yeah. And uh, at the outset, I'd like to thank RSI and the young brigade, uh, everyone here, uh, Rohan, Pooja, and uh, uh, I just forgot uh, Gaurav's daughter's name. Uh, <laughs> wonderful young girl. So thank you so much for making me here. And yes, I was just listening to all the discussion. So I think for me, one key point, one key message, I think every patient, you know, tests your confidence. How much confident are you in delivering the good to that patient? And yes, if you're confident in, you know, speaking to the patient, assuring of the results, I can bet on it. The patient would never buy Dr. Himanshu, but he would always buy Pooja, and say, yes, Pooja, I want to get it done from you, not from your dad, whatever the experience might be, because I, I can test your confidence and you sound really great and wonderful. So I think that is one take home for every youth in India. Be confident in whatever you practice and you'll have your day. So I do not have any financial disclosures. So the spectrum of refractive surgery, I'm very sure uh, Dr. Rupal Shah, Vardman have really come up very well. And the spectrum of refractive surgery, basically, I divide cornea-based and lens-based. And sometimes I combine in my practice whereby addressing high myopes, I would do something on the cornea and the rest on the lens. And I would do away with all the refractive error that the patient has. Gaurav and me and Dr. Himanshu have been practicing for the last 20, 30, 40 years. And yes, we have given those patients endless results with wonderful refractive outcome. So... Fakic intraocular lenses, as the history tells us, have been there in the market, varying from the angle-supported lenses where we had the Kelman or the Ekrisoft lenses, then came in the iris claw lenses. We have seen a lot of these very side lenses, artisan lenses, very flex lenses. And I think for the young generation, they would always see those dislocated lenses lying in the AC rather than themselves doing those iris claw lenses. And then came in an era of posterior chamber lenses, which is called the ICL or the implantable polymer lenses as we, as we call them. So why the posterior chamber concept came in and why this is in vogue in the present day scenario is basically they stand behind the iris. They are far from the endothelium. 
So far from the endothelium, you know, saves the cornea, saves the endothelial damage. They have an excellent cosmesis. So even if you have a candlelight dinner, the lenses really don't shine. So they are invisible to a naked eye. They are as close to the nodal point. So we usually have the patient saying, I see better with these lenses than what I could see with my glasses because you get some amount of magnification factor because of this physiological phenomena. There is always a gain in the retinal size image and that what makes these patients see better what they were seeing with the glasses and a greater effective optical zone. So that translates uh, to a better night vision at the corneal plane. So they are located in the sulcus. So that's a very stable location lying in the sulcus and causing less of the uveitic phenomena earlier with the anterior chamber or the iris supported lenses. They're easy to remove or exchange. We have been seeing that these lenses can be easily removed with the same forcep injecting the viscoelastic in the anterior chamber. They do not require any fixation into the iris and you do not alter shape or remove the cornea. So your cornea remains virgin, and at the same time, you're treating the refractive error of the patient. So the fake IUL for the youngsters, I would say, uh, to begin with, when you sound economical, you can have these wonderful Indian intraocular uh, lenses uh, by the IOC and the biotech, and they work equally well. And if you are a practitioner where you, the patients can afford, STAR is uh, one of the great products that we've been using over years. So a uh, preoperative assessment, a good patient selection and a lens calculation is what is the key for your practice. And I can, you know, bang on this that every young surgeon who is doing a cataract surgery can become a great refractive surgeon just on the practice of an ICL. You don't require great tools. You don't require those fancy uh, Visumax or uh, the laser equipments or this, uh, the, uh, the femto equipment, you just require a good microscope, a preoperative workup, and you can always commit yourself to be a good refractive surgeon. So the right candidate is what is required. We all know that when we have a practice where, you know, uh, it's not a busy practice and you get very few patients, usually you will end up getting those patients who have been rejected by multiple surgeons. So be very careful in choosing the right candidate when you're doing the first few uh, fake IL surgeries, a clear cornea, uh, age more than 19 years, and at least a one or a two year refractive, uh, refractive stability. The patient, you know, you have to see too that the patient doesn't have any systemic illness, any connective tissue disorders, diabetic, and there is no fundus pathology. So off late of these myopic patients that we have been dealing, we have made it mandatory to screen these patients on an OCD. The macula has to be screened because usually they are high myopes. So age, as I said, 21 to 60, you have to check out for the refractive stability. The anterior chamber depth that I'll be talking later is usually more than 2.8. Now, this is one very strict principle which we all should adhere. I would not go even to 2.79. So 2.8 is my cutoff from the endothelium when I talk for the anterior chamber depth. The angles, yes, you all should do a gonioscopy and the angles should be open, grade three and grade four. Patients, ideally, in the initial, when you pick up, they shouldn't have any previous ophthalmic surgeries, especially the corneal refractive surgery and no previous ocular pathology and uh, where uh, the cornea should be clearly ruled out for Fuchs dystrophy or a low endothelial cell counting. If you have access to a specular count, I think this is one very great tool which you should do. Off-label indications, to start with the refractive surgery, you shouldn't attempt the off-label indications because you might get a lot of those patients, keratoconus patients or keratoconus suspect, which have been rejected for refractive surgery, who might come to you in your chamber demanding for a refractive surgery. So be very careful. Off-label indications could be after penetrating keratoplasties, dal, intracameral, intercornal rings, or keratoconus uh, where we have stabilized uh, by cross-linking. In kids, we have been doing ICLs where you have high and isometropic uh, patients and in pseudophagic patients as a piggybagging procedure. Strict contraindications for patients who have a pre-existing glaucoma, cataract, uveitis, or any other ocular pathology uh, which could interfere with their uh, visual activity. Monocular patients should be uh, avoided in your initial practices. Narrow angles and definitely small anterior chamber depths are a strict no-no. Always assess these patients after dilatation because a lot of these times, these high myopes could have zonular abnormalities, 
they could have subluxated lens or sometimes ciliary body abnormalities where uh, you could end up in some disaster so the recommended ocular examination i would again say a very good history taking a refraction which is uh, both manifest and cycloplegic a good anterior segment evaluation where you are doing a good pupil and a palpable aperture slit lamp examination the anterior chamber configuration iris topography cornea and the lens evaluation and the measurements on different equipments now these measurements basically boil into two major uh, investigations that we are worried for the anterior chamber depth and the white to white assessment now this boils basically to calculating out the sizing or the size what icl you would order so the icl sizing after the refraction once you have the refractive error in your hand you would boil down to calculating out the anterior chamber depth and the anterior chamber depth for me if you do not have any equipment you could even use it on an ultrasound uh, the a scan that you have but you need to calibrate that uh, calculations of this so the anterior chamber depth i would always talk on the endo acd endo means from the endothelium to the anterior surface of the lens and that the two most common uh, the tools to calculate the most reliable would be the pentacam and the second would be the il master if you have an access to an il master or an op scan or if your colleague has i think there is no shame in getting these patients done from a common center in your initial practice if you do not have an access to these equipments a white to white can easily be calculated out by using a digital caliper which is not a very uh, 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 costly tool and uh, this can also be correlated by using an il master or an op scan or gone are those days where we were really calculating out the sulcus to sulcus by using a ubm it is a too tedious job but now i think the nomograms that we have uh, with the uh, the digital caliper it gives a quite an accurate results the angle assessment as i have already mentioned using a gonioscopy and you are, if you have an access to a specular yes a specular count shall always be done and an oct macula should always be performed to rule out if there is an any kind of an occult cnvm in these high myopic patients so what actually this uh, sizing boils down is what is called as the wall so this vault is basically the distance between the posterior surface of the icl and the anterior surface of the natural lens so this is what we are aiming at uh, after getting a good sizing uh, an adequate uh, vault would be uh, somewhere uh, i just missed out that slide so an adequate vault would be uh, somewhere between uh, half the thickness of the cornea to maybe one and a half thickness of the cornea so 250 microns to 750 microns though recently uh, the ics that we have have a central hole and this uh, these are called the v4c models and these are quite sparing when we are talking of the low walls because they usually uh, give you that normal physiology of aqueous flow and hence the cataract formation in these uh, subsets of patients it's quite low when we have a low wall so a quick comparison of uh, the uh, the anterior chamber depth using uh, various equipments uh, usually uh, the pentacam works for the best and the il master and the op scan uh, usually have a uh, difference of almost 0.2 when we are talking of uh, the anterior chamber depth so the white to white initial cases i would recommend you to take these patients in your or put a drop of xylocaine put a speculum look under the microscope take the digital caliper and measure uh, this uh, white to white under the microscope because uh, with this you will be able to judge uh, exactly where the limbus is and in case if you have doubt you can take multiple readings both horizontal and vertical compare both the eyes and if in case there is a gross discrepancy between the two eyes you should uh, you know check on a different equipment so as i mentioned white to white on an il master 700 uh, could give you an error of 0.3 mm uh, as compared to a pentacam so i would trust the pentacam the best uh, when uh, white to white uh, and the anterior chamber depth calculation is done so this is what i was talking about uh, an idle vault would be somewhere between 250 to 750 microns an undersized icl where you have a vault less than 125 micron vault and this is usually uh, risks the patient for an anterior subcapsular opacification and an oversized icl is usually more than a 1000 micron vault and these are the two extreme of the conditions where you really have to think in and going either a step up and a step down when you are doing a sizing and you really need to exchange the icl 
Uh, recent, there has been a thought on uh, the lens rise. What exactly lens rise means? Uh, if you draw a horizontal line across uh, the lens and you see the vertical height, this is what is uh, the, the lens rise. And this rise is a measure of actually the distance between the line from the angle to angle, and then is measured on a fixed point in the anterior chamber. So there are a lot of points uh, taken in where you are considering when you see the surprises uh, once the lens goes and sits in the, inside the anterior chamber and you feel that the vault is uh, slightly shaky. One of these factors could be uh, the lens rise. So if the rise is less than 600 microns and the anterior cha chamber depth is greater than 3.2, there appears to be a very low risk of pigment dispersion or a touch. Now, once you have taken uh, the refractive error and you have calculated out the white to white and the anterior chamber depth, your data goes to uh, the manufacturer, whichever you want to uh, you know, uh, implant. And this is how the size uh, is calculated by them. So uh, if I talk about your corneal white to white is 11.15 and the anterior chamber depth value comes to around three, the lens they would order you is a 12.6 uh, uh, millimeter size lens. Now, uh, the surprises comes when you are dealing with the extreme of the conditions. That means if you have a white to white of 11.64 and you have an ACD value of 3.3, now between 11.64 to 11.65, the lens size can vary one step. So these are those patients where you really need to find out, figure out what uh, vault are you looking at. And in cases of toric ICLs, I would always go one side up because I really want the lens to be stable in the anterior chamber and not a lens which would give me a rotation day one. A quick word for the material with which these lenses are made up of. Uh, we know the star, uh, the, is, uh, the ICL is made up of a polymer material. Polymer is basically uh, uh, biocompatible uh, and uh, to me, I would say uh, over a series of almost 15 years that we have, we, uh, we have been doing, we have hardly any seen any abnormal reaction in the anterior chamber. So these lenses are very flexible. And whenever you uh, try to explain these lenses, even with the same forceps, you just go in, pluck it, and you can just push it out. So very soft, biocompatible material and uh, no flare and no cellular reactions. And it is because of the fibronectin layer which is coated on it, which makes it biocompatible. A quick word of uh, this, uh, the IPCL lenses, and this is the product of uh, our own Indian companies, and this is the IOCare, and uh, these lenses, if you see, they have another uh, multiple holes, and which give you further uh, control on the, uh, the vaulting that they have. They usually have uh, both for myopia, the toric lenses, press biopic lenses also, and the press biopic toric that these companies usually have. Biotech is another uh, great product, and we've been using off late these lenses, and uh, these are made up of uh, hydrophilic acrylic as against the polymer lenses, and uh, they also work equally well and with uh, very great stability of the toric lenses in the anterior chamber. Now, once you have these lenses uh, implanted, the two most important intraoperative, I would have loved to show the uh, the intraoperative surgical videos, but because of the shortage of time, I would not really impinge into the time, but I would just like to touch uh, two great points. The incision size, in my experience, is what is very important. You exactly have to have a three millimeter incision whenever you are doing an ICL because the injector delivery system with a three millimeter incision snugly fits into it. You do not have an injector delivery system, which is really shaky, either it goes more in the anterior chamber or it gets off the anterior chamber. So exactly the incision size of three millimeters is what is I target and a delivery system. Once you have uh, in the anterior chamber, you can either use a sodium hyaluronate or you can use a, a methyl cellulose. And in my practice, methyl cellulose works well and both these can be easily washed off. Be careful when you're doing these lenses because in cases of cataract, you are directing the lens posteriorly. That means towards the posterior pole. But whenever you are doing a fakic lens, your direction always has to be towards the opposite clock hour. That means I'm not directing the lens vertically down, but I'm going just straight and directing my pressure towards the opposite angle. Now, that is the way by which you can prevent any damage while injecting these lenses on your normal, uh, the fakic lens that we have. 
So once uh, you have implanted these lenses, they can be carefully tucked in. You have to have the day one picture where you really need to find out the vault. And the vault can be calculated out by the OCT that you have. Even if you don't have an access to an OCT, uh, good experience on a slit lamp can make you uh, access uh, what is the vault. And you can just compare by the thickness of the cornea to the gap between the ICL and the, uh, the normal lens that you have. And this would give you a fair idea of the vault that you have. So 250 to 750 is a normally, or maybe half the thickness of the cornea to one and a half thickness of the cornea is uh, what the vault that we're aiming at. So low vault, yes, can cause cataract. And I said 125 micron, less than that, you should seriously think of exchanging one uh, size higher. And a high vault, maybe a more than a thousand micron, could end up uh, your patient with secondary glaucoma or increased risk of iris pigmentations. So you really need to, if you have a non-toric ICL, you can just rotate this lens vertically because uh, vertically the internal uh, ACD is more than the horizontal. And this could uh, get back your lenses to a normal world. Uh, but in case of a toric ICL, you really need to exchange these lenses with one size lower. So, uh, uh, with an eye tracy, you can have, uh, if you have access to an eye tracy, the toric misalignment can be calculated, but this can also be calculated out by simply seeing on the slit lamp. And you have those online multiple toric uh, uh, apps that which can give you a fair idea of uh, the rotation of the ICLs. So a quick word for the troubleshooting, because this is you know what uh, people come to me asking and specifically the young population where you have the trouble. So a high wall, if you have a normal IOP, just leave the lens as it is, just observe. But you have a high IOP and your chambers are shallow, you can just put shin viscoelastic and rotate the lens vertically if it's a non-toric lens. But if it's a toric lens, you need to exchange one size lower. A low vault, and if you have no peripheral touch, in case of a V4C, just observe this lens. But if you have a peripheral touch, still you do not have any cataract, you can still observe in cases of V4C. If you have an early non-progressive opacity coming up, still you can observe with a V4C. But if you have a cataract, which is progressive, you need to explain or exchange one size up. So this is a quick troubleshooting uh, in cases of uh, both the extremes of the world that we have. Uh, there have been the lenses have been explanted and the most common complications uh, during uh, these surgeries have been the cataract. And yes, uh, there have been uh, patients with glaucoma, early intraocular pressure rise, but be careful because this cataract formation usually is uh, most commonly reported uh, as an intraocular complication. So whenever you are pushing a lens inside the eye, you have to just see that you are doing in a normal physiological patient. It's not a pathology that you're dealing with. So uh, the causes of explantation, as I said, have been commonly the cataract, endothelial cell loss, coronal decompensation, and sometimes you can have uh, dislocation of these faking and trochlear lenses as well. So thank you very much. Uh, paucity of time, I would definitely sometime on a different platform like to share the surgical videos, the quick tips, and maybe some complications that can be encountered by the young generation. So thank you very much once again for making me a part of the show. And uh, I would like to congratulate and boost up your energy each and every one of you can be a great refractive surgeon. If you do a good cataract surgery, I think a refractive surgery based on fake IOLs is much simpler and much easier than any of those surgeries. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, just picking up from that note itself, just one question. When someone wants to transform from a cataract surgeon to doing your fake IOLs, is it recommended that you first do it on dummy eyes or if you are a prolific or if you're a good enough cataract surgeon, you're good to go straight away on, on, on the eye of a patient. So straight away, my answer was that I never did it on a dummy eye. And yes, I did it under monitorization. There was somebody standing behind me for my first surgery. Because what is more important is that loading, which is very important. Once you have loaded, you can, you know, do it under the microscope. You can release the lens. Don't push it inside the eye, but you can just monitor under the microscope on your patient that the eye that the lens is going in the right way that you want. They reload the lens and then try to do uh, on your first patient. So I think loading is the accents because you just want the lens to un unfold in the right way inside the eye. 
Great. Thank you so much, sir. So, Dr. Anshika, I would like to just bring you in here. Just one question. Uh, is there any exposure that you get to fake IOLs uh, during post-graduation? Uh, Dr. Rohan, so while uh, we do have all the pre-operative investigations that are required for it and it can easily be implemented, but sadly we don't get any exposure during uh, PG except for the one odd patient that we get to see that walks into the OPD, but ICL implantation is not a procedure that we get to learn or train for. Probably we require a fellowship for more exposure after this, but... Uh, Oh, no, if you're getting late for surgery, patient on the table, please leave. Thanks for your time. But otherwise, we'll grill you more. You no, no, I'm, 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 I'm still here for another 10 minutes because uh, these uh, young brigade has really helped me. I was to open up and uh, I requested them uh, just one surgery and I'll finish. No worries. I'm here for 10 minutes. Great, great. So, so any so questions to me? Yes. And I can see Gaurav, you know. I saw, no, I was a very, uh, very excellent talk that you gave. I really enjoyed it. And I think what you said was absolutely correct, you know, uh, doing a dummy lens and then loading it and then uh, learning how to load it and then injecting it and watching under the microscope, how it unfolds and how it can occasionally twist and, you know, can open upside down or, you know, those things are all possible with the ICL. And that's what I think is the key to, otherwise it's a straightforward procedure. And of course, there's more to it than just injecting it and implanting it because post-op you've explained so beautifully. So excellent uh, talk uh, there, Sonu. One message. Oh, you really loved your talk. Oh, thank you, ma'am. One message that I would like to share is uh, maybe last to last year before the COVID, when we had this ICL user meet, maybe uh, somewhere in, uh, I think, Gaurav, you were there, Paris. Mm -hmm. So uh, there we were seeing a lot of these young Chinese uh, doctors who were doing great numbers of ICL. And they were sharing with us that in China now they have uh, those ICL clinics. So they do only cataracts and only ICLs. They don't do any other surgery, no third surgery. So I think why not in India with you? As youngsters, why don't you push in hard and start, uh, I mean, uh, with cataract, you can all do great ICL surgeries. And with low diopters, maybe as low as minus 1, 1 1.5 that we have been practicing now to maybe as high as minus 18 diopters. So why the, why should you should look only for, uh, you know, uh, smile centers or uh, maybe eczema centers? I mean, every one, each one of you can have your own clinic, which is a great refractive center. It is just the confidence that you need to usher inside you and uh, maybe uh, any of those centers anywhere in India which are practicing great numbers, just observe and start with a big go. So, no, you're right. I think China sells about uh, maybe 50 or 100 times more ICLs than India as, as far as star is concerned. Is that right? Correct. I mean, remember the numbers. They were probably yeah. like 50 or 100 times more so than... Every this. time they have those 10,000, 20,000 surgeons uh, doing great numbers in a year. So, China bags all those awards. I think it is maybe because uh, they have a lot of those myopic patients. And secondly, because of those clinics that they've started. So, I think uh, this is one great strategy that we could really because their refractive market is very active. So they've been doing Dr. even Rupal other types of refractive surgeries in hundreds. Dr. Rupal, so, they do uh, thousand, procedures in one OT in one day. You know, I was amazed. I visited one of the centers. Yeah. Where they are doing 100 smile yeah, cases you know, per day. They have high volume. On one, on one machine. And therefore, it's an easy ad because then you can also tackle these higher myopes and places where you can't go on the cornea. In India, price is definitely a limiting factor. Uh, so as the, the, the other things like uh, patients' compliance and, and also not everybody has uh, a suitability for undergoing an ICU because the anterior uh, chamber depth also is not always enough. I think there are two reasons. Once uh, we started ICL, earlier it was reserved for uh, lazy reject patients only. So we started doing ICL like those cases where LASIK was not done. Now it has come in the forefront. Second, some uh, patients have a stigma for putting a lens inside the eye. So LASIK is almost invisible. So they think, don't put a lens. We have to convince them very well that it's not a routine lens surgery. It's just like a film we are putting inside, which has a power. It's not a lens in such. So many of the patients have a stigma for lens also. So we have to explain them. Also, I think people who are in contact sports and all, if there is a risk if they have an ICL in their arm. So you cannot underestimate that also. Yeah. Because these are all young people. They are also going to be in a very active life. And ICL does pose a, a limitation in that sense. Right. 
as compared to a corneal surgery. And Sonu, I think I would agree completely when you said that Pentacam is probably the best because I use the Pentacam for my white to whites uh, other than the calipers and, you know, between the Lenstar and the other machines that we use or the all the other, uh, you know, devices, even the eye trace, the white to white, even when you are measuring manually, like, you know, when you're using the calipers on the machine rather than going by what it automatically decides for you. Even then, I think Pentacam somehow has come out to be the closest to my uh, measurements using the calipers. I don't know if, how the others uh, here feel. I second your thought, Gaurav. Yeah. So, and a second question that I wanted to answer for these young, uh, I mean, they say that we do not have an access to equipments. We can't buy a Pentacam, we can't buy a topographer when we have started in our initial practice. I think for them, uh, getting these patients to one big center, getting it investigated and then operating, I think that works well. So why do you want to invest in the first go? So I think a group practice among eight, 10 people where they have a common access to a diagnostic center and then, you know, uh, pulling in and sharing it. I think that work that should do good for, you know, uh, when you are starting your practice in your early days. So thank you so much, sir. Thank you so much for your time. Uh, it was a pleasure. It was a great talk. Uh, we'll move uh, to the next talk now. Uh, Dr. Rupal Shah, it's, it's a pleasure introducing you, ma'am. She needs no introduction. But for those uh, who are new to the show, Dr. Rupal is the director of New Vision Laser Center in Baroda. And laser... She is an excellent teacher and has had over 1,000 ophthalmologists to do their first LASIK and smile under her guidance. We all have heard from her previously and it's, it's an absolute pleasure to have you on the show. Over to you, ma'am. Thank you, Rohan. I really would like to thank all of you, Rohan, Pooja, Anshika, um, uh, Dr. Balakrishnan, I don't know your name. But all of you, I think, Nikhil, so wonderful what you are taking, what you are doing as, a, as an initiative. And I'm really very happy to be a part of this uh, wonderful seminar that you have organized with the youth wing of IIRSI. So I would be talking about why SMILE. Uh, and this is uh, for people who don't know what SMILE is doing in an eye. Uh, as you all know, eyes are the ones which smile the most. And a real smile comes from the eyes and not just your uh, mouth. And so it is very important to know about this new blue-eyed boy, which is there in refractive surgery. And the younger people, especially, you should know how to expand your uh, field of refractive surgery by adding this new procedure, which has its own advantages. I am a consultant to Carl Zeiss Meditech and I had this opportunity to help in the development of this particular procedure. So what is SMILE? SMILE is small incision, lenticular extraction. It's a new paradigm for performing refractive surgery. What it involves is cutting out a lenticule within the corneal stroma using a femtosecond laser and then subsequently removing it from the cornea using a small incision. The dimensions and the shape of the lenticule confirm to the refractive error to be corrected. So if I have were to describe the SMILE procedure, I'll just show you a small video. This particular procedure is done with a femtosecond laser. Right now, only one company has uh, the market of SMILE, but I'm sure that soon, other laser companies will also come up with smile-like procedures. Here, what we do is, this is creating the posterior part of the lenticule, followed by a side cut. This is followed by an anterior pass of the femtosecond laser, which is separated from the posterior part by the amount of refractive error that you need to correct. And this ends in a small incision. So it basically involves four uh, passes of the femtosecond laser, two in the planes and one vertically to cut the lenticule borders and one ending as a small incision. So totally four incisions, uh, four pass of femtosecond laser. Then you can open this small incision, approach the anterior part of the lenticule. 
which separates it from the overlying stroma. And you can see how nicely you can separate it. This is followed by the posterior part of the lenticule being separated from the underlying stromal bed. I'm purposely showing you a very old video just to stress that the separation is and always have been quite easy. Today, it's even more easy because we know the, the optimum parameters for the laser energy which would help you to not just get a quick vision recovery, but also a very smooth procedure getting done. And once you have both the surfaces separated, you can simply grasp this particular lenticule just at the edge of the incision and remove it from there, followed by a wash on the surface and also a gentle stroking of the anterior surface, which allows a quick recovery the next day. Most times you don't need to go in the interface and wash it, but this ironing is important, leaving the cornea smiling back at you. And it was in 2006 that Professor Secundo and Bloom performed the first 250 eyes in their respective clinics. And they showed that the procedure was feasible, was accurate, but the visual recovery was too slow to compete with LASIK. We at the Center for Sight New Vision Laser Center, Vadodara, started this study in August 2008. And so far uh, we have, this is a little old figure because it's been 13 years now and the numbers are many more. So if you look at the timeline, uh, this is how it went. So in the 2010, the first commercial sales took place. By 2018, more than 1 million procedures were done. And in 2016, the US FDA approval also went through. The remarkable aspects of SMILE are the predictability, accuracy, and stability of the treatment, which has changed only a little since our very first study, even though many aspects of treatment has changed. Now we have much better energy and spot parameters, there is a different scanning pattern which was suggested by us because when we started doing it was a reverse of what it happens today. And that was the cause for a delayed visual recovery which could then be solved. A higher frequency of lasers meant that there were no accumulation of bubbles and therefore a quicker visual recovery because there was no distortion of tissue. And today we have better surgical techniques, better instruments. And you would find that more than 98% of our, all eyes that you treat are within plus or minus 0.5 adapters of the intended correction, which is remarkable because that's what you want after a refractive surgery. And this is not just us who is saying that there are a number of studies done all across the world. One of the studies done by Kemaya et al. showed that 100% of the eyes were within plus or minus 0.5 adapters at six months. We ourselves had 95% of our eyes within plus or minus 0.5 adapters at six months. And, and these were the first few eyes done in the world without any nomogram adjustment. And we were using at that time the slower lasers, which were available at 200 kilohertz, but with a new scanning pattern. At Denmark, they were doing mostly high myopia at that time. And they also showed of the eyes within plus or minus one adapter at three months. And why is it so? It is because corneal reshaping, when you do a procedure like SMILE, is happening without the help of an excimer laser. So you are using only a femtosecond laser and no excimer laser. Excimer laser has its own limitations because it works by a principle of photoablation. And you know that photoablation rate can increase linearly with fluence beyond a certain threshold. This results in a scatter, especially for treatment of high myopia. The photoablation rate also depends a lot on the depth of ablation that you're doing. It depends on the corneal hydration, the humidity, the organic vapors in the environment, and so on and so forth. What happens in SMILE is that only a femtosecond laser is used, which uses cutting instead of ablation, which is a binary process instead of a linear one. So either it cuts or it doesn't cut, there is no uh, little cut or no cut. And 
much less influence on any external factors, which also uh, means that you have a more accurate results. How about inflammation? Since you are making two passes of the femtosecond laser, does it cause more inflammation? It was found that total amount of energy input into the eye with smile is even less than with femtolasic, which results in less inflammation and a very high stability of treatment. And this was a very interesting study done at Singapore, where they showed that when you do a smile procedure as against a LASIK procedure, whatever depth you are working on at, so whatever number you are treating, it's going to have the same amount of energy incident into the cornea. So whether you are treating three diopters or whether you're treating nine, unlike in an excimer laser where you would have much more energy input in a nine diopter case to be treated than a three diopter case, here, because you are making only two passes and a side cut, the energy incident is the same. This also results um, in a very high safety margin. We com compared the results of in, in 25 patients in contralateral eyes, where we did one eye smile, the other eye femtolasic, keeping all the parameters the same. And we found that the smile eyes scored much higher as compared to the femtolasic eye in terms of the safety, even over a period of one year. About the stability of refraction, we found a statistically significant difference when we were treating these high myopes uh, as compared to uh, when you're using femtolasic. Uh, compared to SMILE. And as you can see here, the mean for femtolasic and SMILE were the same because you were treating the same patient. The range was from minus 8 to minus 10 diopters. And while femtolasic at one week showed an average of uh, the mean refraction of plus 0 0.11, at nine months, it was minus 0 0.5, which is a difference of about 0 0.6 diopters. While in a SMILE patient, at one week, it was minus 0 0.04 diopters, and at nine months, 0 0.2, which was a difference of 0.16, which is uh, a significantly diff uh, difference between the two eyes in terms of stability. As regards efficacy, we again found that the smile eyes scored much better as compared to femtolasic eyes. And regarding induction of aberrations, because that was the concern for many people, because you are not able to do a customized ablation, people thought that you would not be able to get the same amount of aberrations or you would be inducing more aberrations. What we need to understand is that this is a different procedure altogether. Here, we are not using photoablation. Excimer laser suffers from peripheral fluence losses. And that's because it's falling as, as an oval in the periphery of the lens that we create. Here, you are cutting out the lenticule and therefore you can make it as you want at whatever depth you want. And this leads to uh, the minimal increase in spherical aberration. And therefore, and this is not uh, shown by only one study, but a number of studies done world over, which showed that the induction of uh, less than 0.12 microns of spherical aberration uh, has, has, happens when you use SMILE instead of femtolasic. Uh, instead of femtolasic. This is uh, also part of that same study where we compared the point spread function and you can see that the SMILE eyes have much better point spread function as compared to the femtolasic eye. So is the image simulation. As you can see, the SMILE eyes definitely show a better image as compared to a femtolasic eye. And you can see that the smile eyes have a true zone of whatever you have destined to create. So if you wanted a six millimeter zone, it was giving you a pure six millimeter zone, unlike in an excimer laser, as you can see here, where you would not, you would have the periphery getting lost in the, in the uh, zone of uh, smoothing or, or uh, a transition zone. And therefore, the results are more stable. And you can also compromise on the zone size slightly, and you would still get away without any night vision issues. As regards the long-term data, SMILE shows remarkable efficacy, safety, predictability at five years. But now we are also doing studies at 10 years, and it's really showing the same uh, things getting, re uh, again, getting reflected. Other advantages are quite stark. There is no flap, so no, no displacements, less dry eyes because it's a smaller incision, less 
uh, less damage to the, uh, the nerve fibers and earlier regeneration. Better patient workflow because you are not going to be changing the bed or the laser stations. And it's an easier cell for patients who want a flap-free, blade-free procedure. So it's truly a pain-free, blade-free, flap-free procedure. You can do up to minus 10 diopters of sphere and minus 5 diopters of cylinder. But uh, myopia or myopic astigmatism less than minus 12.5 diopters of spherical equivalent. And this is, of course, the highest margin. As we know that ICLs, IPCLs are really giving us great results, as Dr. Sonu already pointed out. So you don't really need to treat on the cornea higher myopia than this. The total thickness of the cornea after lenticular extraction, what I go as the lowest limit is at least 375 micron, which means that if I'm, I've made a cap of 100 microns, I still leave at least 275 microns on the bed. And I don't really uh, surpass that limit because we don't really have good ways to determine whether the biomechanical stability remains good after, uh, after any refractive procedure done on the cornea. We still don't have hyperopic treatment or make stay stigmatism treatment possibility commercially, but it's on the way. We've already treated a few hyperopic patients, about 100. And the results are similar, if not better than femtolasic in these cases, with the advantages of not needing to create a flap. If there are other ocular conditions like cataract glaucoma, of course, you don't want to do anything on the cornea and no corneal refractive surgery. If the cornea is very thin, somewhere where I would not want to do even a PRT, I would not really do go ahead and do a smile procedure. People who have uncontrolled diabetes, diabetic retinopathy, severe dry eyes still remain a contraindication. So smile is a technique which has come of age. It shows across several studies remarkable accuracy, stability, safety, comparable and sometimes even superior to femtolasic. And in the next decade, it is likely to become the technique of choice to treat refractive errors. So all of you young ophthalmologists there, please, please go ahead and also incorporate this into your, myop your myopia uh, or refractive practice because this is definitely going to be a useful addition in your practice. All of you are most welcome to come and visit me in my Vadodara Center. And uh, we also train people. So... If you need, you are most welcome to ask for him. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you so much, ma'am, for that beautiful presentation. So now, due to paucity of time, we're going to proceed to the next speaker, and we're going to have a combined discussion for both at the end. Introducing Dr. Nikhil Balakrishnan. He's going to talk to us about advanced surface ablation, the shift in accuracy and patient comfort. Dr. Nikhil is a young FACO refractive surgeon based out of Mumbai. He's done his fellowship from Narayan Netrale, Bangalore. Over to you, sir. Uh, are my slides visible? Yes. Okay. Uh, so today I'm going to be talking on advanced surface ablation. Uh, so we'll all know that PRK or advanced surface ablation was the procedure of choice in the 19 uh, in the 1990 up to 2000. But off lately, we have seen that PRK has gone out of vogue. So what are the reasons that why PRK has gone out of vogue was mainly because the haze which developed post the PRK and patients who complained of po pain post the PRK procedure. So what are the causes of haze that we found post PRK? Uh, we have a lot of published literature which showed that ocular inflammation leads to altered wound healing and also that uh, high UV radiation post the procedure causes late onset of haze. So how do we overcome these pitfalls of PRK? Now, we uh, in our practice, uh, what we follow are different rituals to prevent haze. What are the different preoperative uh, rituals? One is to treat any kind of ocular inflammation, be it meibomian gland disease. So you uh, treat it well with, uh, by giving the patient azithromycin, uh, a copious amount of lubrications, hot fermentation. And in severe cases, you may even want to do something like an EI or a lipi, lipi flow and treat the MGD prior to the procedure. 
Uh, treatment of dry eyes and ocular surface inflammation is again very important prior to undergoing this procedure. Uh, always check for contact lens intolerance because if the patient has been contact lens intolerance, these patients usually do not do well po uh, with PRK. Uh, we always check if the patient has any keloids or if the patient uh, is on any kind of acne treatment because again, these are the patients who are going to develop haze post the PRK procedure. Uh, then finally, also checking for vitamin D deficiencies. Uh, if the patient has vitamin D deficiencies, it's very important to treat it first, either in, in mild cases, either oral by vitamin D supplements or in severe cases by even injectable vitamin D. Uh, now, what, are the diff what do we do intraoperatively? Now, as we know, PRK can, the epithelium which is removed in PRK can either be done by using alcohol. Uh, it can be done mechanically either by using a hockey stick, a spatula or an amoils brush or you can do a laser removal of the epithelium. Now in our study, which we conducted at our center, we found that the haze on the third day post the procedure was most in patients with alcohol removal than compared to mechanical removal than compared to the laser removal. So patients who had undergone laser removal had the least amount of haze on third day post-op. Now what are the diff are the, in intraoperatively, Therefore, once the best method of not of taking out the epithelium with a laser prevents haze. And as we know, there are different modalities. You have the a trans PRK, which can be done by the Schwind machine, the trans PRK, which is done by the Streamlight also. Uh, now, in this, the advantage of the Schwind over the Streamlight is that the, uh, the actual zone of epithelium removal in the Schwind can be adjusted to as minimal as 6 to 6.5 millimeters, whereas a Streamlight usually takes out the epithelium at around 8.5 millimeters. So it takes longer for the, the epithelium to regenerate. Therefore, patients do have pain for a few days postoperatively in when you under patients undergo a Streamlight. Uh, now, intraoperatively, it is very important to use a, the, the use of mitomycin C. Uh, we use mitomycin C 0.02%. Uh, per diopter being treated, we keep the mit mitomycin C sponge for around about 10 seconds per diopter. Usually up to six diopters is what we can, is the upper limit for the treatment of PRK. So maximum 60 seconds is what we keep these metal sponges for. Post-operatively, what we do is one, definitely steroid eye drops for one month post-operative patients. As steroids cannot be continued for long periods of time, we continue cyclosporins for up to almost three months. Uh, supplementating the patient with vitamin D, as I had already spoken about, and also very important is UV protective glasses, as UV radiation is known to be one of the causes of late onset haze. Another thing is to use balanced salt solution for the prevention of pain post PRK, both before the ablation and after ablation. It is very important to use chilled balanced salt solution as this is known and published to decrease the incidence of pain. Uh, a study which we conducted at my alma mater, Nara and Netralai, was where we used AccuVail soaked BCLs, that is Ketorolac soaked BCLs. Uh, what we did is that the BCL was injected with AccuVail it was kept for 20 minutes so it got properly soaked and then placed over the eye following the PRK procedure. Now, what we found in a study done at our center again was that the laser removal in that the epithelial healing was much faster than mechanical and even faster than alcohol removal because the epithelium is removed in a more organized ma manner and hence epithelium, epithelial healing goes on faster as compared to the other procedures. So, uh, we saw that hence these patients they, by using the laser had faster wound healing, faster epithelium healing and hence had lesser pain as compared to mechanical or alcohol removal uh, post the procedure. Now, what are the advantages of a surface ablation over LASIK or SMILE is that the main reason, main thing, the main reason why would we would do a PRK is because we all know is that PRK is a stronger biomechanical procedure as compared to the other two procedures. And the reason for this is that in a PRK, the anterior corneal nerves are not traversed, which happen in both the LASIK or in the SMILE procedure. So therefore, PRK is extremely beneficial, especially in patients who have a suspicious topography that is a very steep cornea, a thin cornea with patients with low pachymetry. If you have a pentacam and a bad D map, patients who are showing a, a poor bad D or a suspicious bad D, these are the patients who you should do a PRK than a LASIK or a SMILE. Again, in a patient of an irregular epithelium, any patients have an epithelial hypertrophy, 
PRK would be the procedure of choice. This is because in LASIK or in SMILE, the epithelium is untouched. Your cap or your flap is at a much deeper level. So the patient is always going to have a poor, poor quality of vision because of the aberrations which are induced by the, epithel by the hypertrophied epithelium. As compared to in PRK, in which you are, you're, you're debriding the epithelium off, so it would be preferable that if the patient has an epithelium of almost 60 to 64 and it is irregular in different places, you can do a manual removal of the epithelium. And uh, if the patient has a regularized epithelial hypertrophy, then you could do it with a laser. Uh, we also, we also is well known that because uh, the PRK is a biomechanically stronger procedure, when you do a search, you even find that the incidence of ectasia is the least in PRK as compared to LASIK or a smile. Now, also, as we've already discussed in this talk earlier, people who have professional requirements, people who are in the army, navy, where you cannot, where they do not need a scar to be seen, prefer to undergo a surface procedure than a LASIK or a smile. And people who are playing contact sports, football, rugby, any kind of procedure where the flap could be displaced would, would do well with the PRK. So I'll just run through a few examples in of, of procedures where we could go through a P, where we could do a PRK instead of doing a LASIK or a smile. So here we had a patient who was a 29 year old patient. Uh, here we see with a refractive error of around about 2.75. A patient had a packy, had a borderline packy of around about 503 as the thinnest corneal uh, thickness, and also had a steep cornea of around about 46 diopters and also a suspicious bad D. So such, such a patient would do well with the PRK. You can go ahead and do a PRK instead of taking a risk with going ahead with a LASIK or a smile in this patient. Again, a second scenario here, a borderline PACI, again, a 501 thinnest corneal thickness, but I had a posterior elevation, again, in the suspicious range of 16 microns. So again, here, which the reason for which was a poor bad D again, and such a patient, again, you can consider growing a PRK in this patient. Uh, and finally, any patient who has a thin cornea, a, th a cornea of thickness of just around about 490, would again, you can consider doing an, uh, an, a refractive error of only around about minus three diopters would do well with the PRK. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Nikhil. Uh, can I bring in Dr. Gaurav, sir, here? Uh, you do smile as well as PRK in your practice. And we know that now there are surgeons in the country who do an only smile practice and an only PRK practice. So it's, it's you know, the, both the spectrums, right at the end of the spectrum. So my question to you is, sir, that uh, when you, how do you basically, when you're doing both these procedures, as we had discussed earlier in Dr. Roda's talk that, you know, we were saying MK has come a long way. Similarly, even uh, PRK has come a long way. So now is it a better proposition for someone to go for an only PRK practice vis-a-vis -vis what it was five years ago or 10 years ago? Um, Rohan, actually, you're right that uh, today, because, uh, you know, uh, doing purely surface actually requires the most basic investment, which means just an examiner, right? So definitely makes sense for somebody who's starting out on practice and does not even want to invest on a micro keratome. And frankly, with the newer lasers, uh, doing a pure surface practice is entirely possible today, except that, you know, I would still be reluctant to do very high corrections uh, uh, with pure surface. And maybe, you know, there your, your threshold for switching to fake lenses could be much lower. You know, so it is entirely possible to do pure surface and I do a lot of surface. I really strongly believe in surface. And as Nikhil said, you know, I've been, uh, you know, I started using AccuVail about three years back uh, with when Narayan Nitrale started uh, working on it and they were publishing the issues. And, you know, then I did the trials for the uh, Accusate kind of eye drops, which are also similar to AccuVail because AccuVail is no longer available. And we do a lot of trans PRK last one or two years. So PRK has come a long way. We do a lot of trans PRK and my PRK practice actually grew in the last two years from just about 5% to maybe 10, 15, 20%. And, uh, you know, LASIK now forms maybe just about a 10 to 20% part of the practice and SMILE occupies about 60 to 70% of the practice. So uh, in that sense, you know, but the exclusion criteria for SMILE and LASIK are about the same, you know. So I don't have a more relaxed criteria for SMILE at all. So definitely, uh, you know, if I'm not planning to do uh, LASIK, I will not be planning to do SMILE for someone just because the cornea is either thinner or it's suspect. I do occasionally perform smile extra, which again works pretty well, but I switch to surface whenever I you know, want to switch to the surface because of reasons of, you know, thinner corneas or suspect corneas. And I feel that PRK is definitely a very, very safe procedure, but there's only one catch to this. 
patients should have enough time to recuperate you know so you have to tell them that your visual gain see with smile patients are smile and lasik both patients are 6 6 or you know something day 1 day 2 onwards and they are doing extremely well so the wow factor is phenomenal but with prk you have to tell them sometimes they keep coming back to you for almost 15 20 days or a month or even longer sometimes because the epithelial remodeling takes uh, you know a longer time so that's probably the only thing i don't scare them about pain anymore with uh, with prk good pain control i don't actually counsel them that it's going to hurt more than anything because they haven't undergone lasik or smile to differentiate and the frankly the difference is very small now with these uh, soaked contact lenses thank you thank you sir dr manchu sir your thoughts yeah yeah prk you are relaxed as a surgeon basically whenever in doubt do a prk <laughs> that's the simple answer no question but will you be able to survive only with prk if you do only prk not necessarily you can pronounce that you are doing the safest surgery or the topical surgery but uh, you need the other armamentarium also in life uh, it is there's definitely more pain elements steroid response are are worse patients rupal has seen a huge change from prk surgery he has seen from where from rupal way back when you started and prk the only way it going about and and then you seen the problems and those who have seen those problems are scared to do For it one and a half years i did only prk and Correct. i have learned so much about corneal refractive surgery simply in that one whole year <laughs> uh, but as as you said uh, it it's deceptively simple but you do have to be taking good good post op care and you should be sure that the patient is following up with you otherwise right from steroid response to haze to so many other complications can occur so you can't really take these surgery like you one patient of haze for a long time few months really puts you back in life yes. you know you 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 lose your confidence in your own self yes. you haven't done anything wrong but one patient having haze and they have gone out in the ultraviolet light you tell them not to go out in the sun and they have gone out whatever that you have to blame also you have to make sure that you have the time to follow these patients up so you are going to be seeing the patient one visit then second visit you operate on both thighs they follow you up till the epithelium heals so another 2 to 3 days and then you need to see them at least once a month for the next 3 months which would mean that on an average at least 10 visits per person and if they if, if that is if they are going to heal normally if they get steroid response or if they get haze then they are going to follow you up, up with you even more while as against that if you do a lasik or a smile like procedure you see them one day operate the next next day you see them you don't know them they don't know you after that and that's the case in most most people and uh, it, it has its disadvantages also because when i was doing only prk i used to get i used to know everything about my patient their family their their happy moments their sad moments their neighbors <laughs> what dress they wore in their wedding and i used to be called for so many weddings and those patients are getting their children now for surgery well If, if somebody has undergone a lasik or a smile they see you at the airport they look at you from far see you again and then they would very reluctantly come to you and ask oh, are you dr rupal shah are you the one who did the treatment on me <laughs> and this is horrible they don't even know you you know <laughs> this is one good aspect you know i mean totally different aspect of looking at how to choose a refractive surgery and experience as a refractive surgeon dr rupal amazing but i really enjoyed your talk uh, both both your talks i think dr rupal you yeah you did a good job smiled so well i mean i completely could relate to everything and then nikhil spoke so well because both are very close to my heart both yeah. surface ablations and smile and uh, remarkable i think but, one uh, i would like to just stress that each and every procedure in in corneal refractive surgery definitely has some some space in that armamentarium that you have so you cannot be an only smile surgeon or an only prk surgeon or an only lasik surgeon or an only contoura surgeon it just doesn't work that way because each eye is different and each eye would have a different requirement It, it, so you can't really if possible try and incorporate as many types and as many different techniques as possible then you will be able to cater to a lot many people and give them the best possible outcome in in within their limitations dr roda sir your yeah, i think dr vardhan has covered it well that no procedure is ideal you have to choose according to your patient's requirement now everything is there in the armamentarium and okay. everything has to be utilized as dr rubel has said and the recent resurgence of surface ablation i think two or three factors is there 
one was the mitomycin c which has changed the game entirely second is the newer software we are getting in ashwin or we are getting in alcon where the epithelium removal has become very very polished now we are getting wave front optimized treatment of the epithelium which was not earlier there and which is not available with ptk so this has changed a lot so we are getting a very clear cut margin and this epithelium removal is uniform that is making the results much more better and people have started doing uh, correction up to when minus 12 also for sur surface ablation earlier we were limited to three or four diopters we were scared to go in to six diopters now uh, dr pavin is doing a lot of in uh, lvp he is doing around 12 i myself is doing nine or 10 up to and finding very good results of course the follow up should be very very good and you have to make sure the patient who is using a goggles it should be 100% uv blocker if you ask a patient to buy from the market it may not be 100% blocker they may be uv glasses but they will not be 100% blocker so you have to make sure you have to check it yourself or you have to supply it yourself and you have to explain the well so everything is there and depends what sort of patient requirement is there it's not one thing fits all so you have to choose according to the patients so we thank you sir automatic c3 r happens with sunlight yeah <laughs> okay. nikhil i have a question for you if uh, if i'm allowed to ask you know yesterday i was uh, dealing with a patient who has a cornea which is around like 500 and a correction of about like 3 4 diopters of myopia and we noticed a little bit of inferior steepening on pentacam and on topography both and when we did the oct epithelium maps we really realized that it those that inferior steepening was basically epithelial hyperplasia inferior slight epithelial hyperplasia the epithelium going to about like 59 microns and the average epithelium was about 54 to 55 and that was accounting for that inferior steepening and uh, you know we realized that it's not actually a true steepening yet it became a suspect cornea because you know the topography maps uh, showed up and you know it was a very big dilemma the posterior elevation maps were fine everything looked good so we actually spoke to the patient and discussed all the procedures and then you know i offered her a surface ablation now once surface ablation you know it came to trans prk versus uh, you know amoyles brush or whatever and now when you want to do a, a trans epithelial prk uh, what do you feed like you know you have an inferior epithelial steepening and if you want to do like a 57 or a 58 and other areas are like 54 so you know if you're going to do like 60 microns of epithelium which my machine permits only 5 micron steps so you know it was a big dilemma and I, this question is open to all the stalwarts sitting here should we actually do a surface ablation if we should do a surface ablation should we do a trans prk which will remove uniform epithelium so there's no masking which means that you know in some areas you'll probably have more epithelium like the epithelium will remove and then you may have a imprint on the stroma or should you do an alcohol assisted or a brush assisted epithelium or should you just do a smile or a lasik where the epithelium is left as it is so this lady had used to wear contacts till 3 months back stopped wearing it for 3 4 months but she continues to have a little bit of epithelial and over 2 weeks that thing did not change with lubricants and everything that we tried so this is the question and dilemma so i think if we do a lasik or a smile the area which the inferior steepening because of the epithelial hyperplasia will yet persist because we're not touching the epithelium at all which would then mean the patient the abrasions induced due to that so the patient would not have that wow factor the the abrasions playing a role the quality of vision would not be that great uh, as coming to if you're doing a prk whether you do a trans prk and uniformly remove the epithelium or whether you do a my option would i think do a manual removal of the epithelium because when uh, it's better than uniformly removing 60 because there's a localized area if in case the uh, it was a uniform epithelial hypertrophy all over then i think a trans prk would have been would be a better option in that choice anybody else wants to chip in yeah agree on that if the epi, epi the map is not very proper or you see there is a, a thickening is in one place i think it's better to remove you get a better surface to start with that's a uniform surface and mechanical uh, debridement is much much preferred in these cases my only worry was that even if i do whatever kind of debridement like a surface i mean remove the epithelium whatever you way you want how how to predict what kind of epithelial uh, healing will happen will it still persist that if inferior see it could be just an inferior epithelial hyperplasia for something you know maybe exposure keratopathy it could be a dry it could be so many things it's not just necessarily a contact lens warpage which has persisted for like beyond 3 or 4 months of discontinuation of contact lenses so if it comes back you know the patient is going to still have aberrations and you know the thought was that if you probably did a smile 
uh, you know, the patient is going to maintain the epithelium that she has always had, the hyperplasia will persist and you correct uh, what you want, you know, and let that epithelium not modify your results. So it's a bit of a, you know, at the end of the day, I was a little confused at what would have been the right choice and I still don't have an answer, but uh, I thought I'll share this but, question. You know, uh, even after LASIK or SMILE, there can still be some amount of epithelial remodeling, even if you've not touched them. Definitely. So, you know, it still remains still a a very gray area, right? whether you should be doing that or not. Absolutely. Uh, I would do trans epithelium. And use epithelium as a mask. So what we did eventually was a trans epithelial, but what we did do was we left the cornea a little wet. I mean, I chose to do 60 microns and I did not kind of, you know, wipe the cornea yeah, off so like I would normally do. So I did a little bit of masking so that, you know, I was removing some of the, you know, uh, the hyperplasia. hyperplasia area more than the other areas. So that way probably, I don't know. Thank you. So, just before we end, the one last Kaun uh, Banega Karodpati question. There are no four options here, just one option for a youngster new into the practice, low on a budget. What is the preferred practice uh, refractive platform? All seniors to comment, please, to start with. If you have I to choose just one. Your space at Dr. Gaurav Lutra's place or Dr. Rupal's place, CSI. Go to the nearest center where you can book your place and start working. Don't I give up. I actually agree with him, Manchu, that first you build your practice, see how much you can do in terms of reflect. See, it is not going to be as much as you would do, be able to do if you have your own laser. But it would give you a fair idea about your inclination, your dedication towards corneal refractive surgery. It requires a different form of commitment to time and learning and, and the time given to the patient. If you find that you are willing to do that and if you have an aptitude for that, then probably it's worth investing your life saving on these expensive equipments. Otherwise, you are just making the equipment company richer and you are going to be working for them without them paying you anything. In fact, you would be paying them more. So I really don't think it's a good idea to just jump into buying a laser if you are still... a, a somebody who do, do not have uh, really a background or or uh, nobody who would be like, you know, shelling out the money for you. A group practice is a good idea. I see that nowadays, uh, you young guys are much more sensible. You all can get together and do a group, group practice, um, provided there is some amount of understanding and as well as uh, honesty amongst each one of you. Uh, you could have somebody who is neutral, who is running the center and everybody can go and use that center so that the business aspect remains out of your friendship. Uh, and of course, this option is open to go and use the pre-existing laser centers. And I think that is not a bad option. So, thank you. Thank you so much, ma'am. Uh, everybody, have... everybody agrees, don't buy Everybody agrees, don't buy anything. Yeah. It's better to have your group practice or share practice that's going to be much easier way to enter the refractive market. As yeah. such, the refractive market is quite saturated as for now. So if you don't have a volume, you can't survive because the running cost is so high that even we have invested best of equipments and your volume is not high, it's very difficult to survive at that place. You can't meet the running expenses also. So you have to make a good market survey. And to be initiate yourself, first you don't invest anything from your side. Just go start practice, learn the tricks, then you see what is good for your locality or your area or your place. Then you try to decide what you what is best for you. Great. So bottom line, don't rush into it. Yes. Uh, I would like to add here that, uh, you know, first, before even delving into refractive surgery uh, or investing into equipment or even investing into investigative modalities, I think what's most important to have is to have the right mindset for refractive surgery, which means like look at every patient and his attendant as a potential refractive surgery patient, you know, and uh, not that you're going to push refractive surgery, which means that don't start telling every person who walks into your clinic wearing glasses that, you know, why aren't you getting LASIK or something like that? That's totally, totally not done. But, you know, start looking at potential patients who are, you know, like every potential patient who visits you with a refractive error is, or even with a cataract for that matter, is a candidate for refractive cataract surgery. So a mindset of achieving emetropia in every patient, be it cataract, be it LASIK, be it a pterygium, be it 
what if whatever you are doing the mindset to be give a great refractive result be it even a dry eye or be it even a good refraction in pre- prescribing the right glasses or contact lenses or giving a good fit on a keratoconus patient for contact lenses making sure that you have that you know strive for that patient having that emetropia or good vision quality vision that's probably the mindset which you need first and then of course you know with your existing equipments you can always do few investigations to see and you know investigate whether the refractive surgery is possible for a patient and then i think you know going on gradually investing into maybe an optical biometer into a topographer which add to your practice working up every patient for refractive surgery and then going and using the refractive surgery momentarium at some other places and maybe doing more of fake lenses to begin with than laser surgery because fake lenses everybody can do whoever does cataract so you know maybe threshold to an icl or a fake lens could be a little lower for people who don't have their own equipments and all these things put together and then gradually as everybody has said growing the practice and then eventually maybe buying an examer first thing would be probably i still feel would not be a visumax not to rule but i would still think that examer is more uh, you know, right and, and i do feel that even uh, when you when you actually graduate to smile it would be great to be doing uh, femto lasik first because when you get the hang of handling flaps and the dissection you are you become a much better smile surgeon so graduating from maybe yeah, it has to be one step at a time absolutely starting from a, maybe a surface ablation with micro keratotom then in a year or two graduating to a, a femto second laser if possible a visumax kind of a thing which is you know having the option to do smile and flaps but if not possible then at least a, a femto lasik and then graduating to so you know there is no shortcuts in life i think yeah, even if you have dr gaurav or dr himanshu as your father <laughs> so on that note uh, i'd request uh, the organizing committee of irsi dr himanshu and dr gaurav uh, to give a vote of thanks to our speakers i think the president does the honors thanks thanks very much uh, dr arora dr gaurav dr rupal uh, for all your precious time to be here with us still late evening away from the family and as rohan anshika puja and nikhil have done this a great job for the youth to really get motivated into this rohan one place where i you know last question you said don't but don't delay it the sooner the better get into it you will have no choice you will do it later you rather do it sooner than later that is my answer to most people and uh, very important that everybody understand the value of this it's a part of your life and it is definitely going to help you get more patients because you'll get those families with you and that's where your cataracts and the other things also will come so thanks very much for initiating people and making them aware of uh, the good part of lasik surgery the bad part is very small we generally you know we keep talking of complications but they are minuscule amount don't get overwhelmed the elephant is the happiness between the surgeon and the patient go ahead get on with it thanks very much for the time over to you gaurav if you have a few words to tell the youth thanks uh, dr manchu and uh, you know all the wise words uh, from our president but uh, i would like to congratulate the youngsters for doing a wonderful job of selecting the topics the speakers all experienced speakers who spoke really well so you know i think uh, you guys are doing a great job and we are proud of you um, everybody you know uh, all the young team is doing uh, excellent and we really feel that um, this these uh, webinars from the youthful irsi chapter are very meaningful for the young audience and i hope we can reach out to many more of them and thankfully these are archived on youtube as well so you know it's good for anybody to go back and see them when they would like to do it so i think continue the great work and uh, you know all the best for your future endeavors thank you thank you so much sir we would like to also thank uh, team microvision mr ashok and mr navneet for all their help at the back end for this re- event to run smoothly uh, thank you so much and see you all next month next month chapter 9 our topic is optics and the lens should be an interesting one thanks dr rupal thanks aruda sir and nikhil and thanks everyone thank you well done good well night done, thank you thank you thank you for making us a part thank good you night. thanks to all of good you night. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. And I would like to just dip in with uh, you know a quick one that we have a live surgery yeah. webinar coming up on Tuesday, coming Tuesday evening at 9 p.m. where our president is going to be showing some recorded live surgery sessions. Very exciting surgery is coming up, so please tune in 9 p.m. on 27th of uh, July uh, for an IRSI live surgery webinar, and uh, we look forward to having some exciting, eco challenging cases. So all the best. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.